Hello? Captain? Captain, are you there? Oh, oh, oh I've had a terrible time. The sharks have taken my arms and the seagulls have picked my legs to bone. I've got no reason to go on, lad. I'm but a sandbag now. Throw me overboard into the drink. I'll drift the seas like a forgotten crisp packet. Oh, but Captain, have you not heard? The Lookout Sir podcast is still going. Oh. They're creating content every oh. week. There's nothing new about that, lad. But, but Captain, that's just it. Dan and Phil, they've, they've both got beards. Beards? Mm. I feel a change in the wind. Quick, lad, grab that rope. Throw it around me. I may have no arms or legs, but I can still be the flag for this very vessel. But Captain, where are we going? You know where, lad. <gasps> the Lookout Sir Podcast. Oh, my God. Why, hello there, you. Welcome to episode 174 of the Warhammer 40,000 podcast, known across the internet and potentially around the world as Look Out Sir. My name is Dan, and it is my sincere privilege and or pleasure to introduce you to this, the 174th episode of the Look Out Sir podcast, and my co-host extraordinaire... The other person involved in making this happen. Dear old Phil, how are you? Uh, I'm good, thanks. I am the OG Beardster uh, out of the two of us now, because we look so That's similar it. with our small beard and big beard. Is that what it is? That's what it is. Except I have a big belly, uh, and, uh, you know, you just got a little bit of podge. Exactly, yeah. So... <laughs> What, what Since I, you got uh, married, Phil, you've uh, you've really let yourself go. I know it's terrible, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's the way. <laughs> you used to be so lean. Now look at you. Oh, no. Disaster. The irony being that by all accounts you look fine. Really, I've not really been keeping tabs. Have I? You know, touched a nerve there? Is there some sort of deep-rooted uh, shame that you're trying to disguise? I wouldn't call it shame, but you know, you know, Christmas has come and gone and left its mark. Put it that way. That's fair, but you have to, you know, you have to bulk up for the winter months, Phil. You can't be expected to, you know, survive winter without a little bit of uh, extra padding. Not well, exactly. Otherwise, you know, when that heating, you know, switches off, you need something to keep you going. Absolutely, indeed. Uh, and on the topic of extra padding, what? Are we padding out episode 174 with? Oh, uh, well, we, the main topic is Codex Dark Angels. The padding is the Age of Sigma Meta Watch slash Balanced Data Slate. Uh, although it's not Balanced Data Slate, it's called something else. It's that thing. Battle That's Scroll, War Scroll, Data Battle Points Adjustment. Jobber, you jobber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. They change the terminology for the stuff all the time, and then you throw in a whole other system, and it gets incredibly confusing. Um, but not so much so that we wouldn't, couldn't, or shouldn't have a five star review. Peter, Peter. Oh, oh hello, what Dad. What are you doing in here, son? Oh, I'm, I'm what just... have I told you about wasting your time with these little plastic figurines? It's not a waste of time. I like it. How dare you talk back to me, Peter? Oh. It's about time you grew up. I don't want to grow up. Oh, man, maybe there's something on the radio. Yeah, this is nicer. Peter, Peter. What's, what's that? That's right, it's me, the ghost of a warm, winning TV and radio presenter, Jeremy Beadle. Jeremy Beadle? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Now, let me tell you here, Sonny. My dad was always telling me to grow up, and what? I never did. And look how successful I was. So oh. ignore him, Peter, and keep playing with that little plastic crack. And while you're at it, listen to the Lookout Sir podcast, which wow. right now is time for the five-star review. Wow, thanks, Jeremy. Who are you talking to with there, son? Jeremy Beadle. What? No! All right, here we go, everyone. This week's five-star review, Philip, comes by way of what do you speculate, maybe, possibly, hmm, 
I would like to think you're going to do something that we haven't done in a while, and that is a Facebook review. Oh, it is something I haven't done in a while, Phil, but unfortunately it is not a Facebook review. It Ooh. is an Ooh. audible.com review, Phil. Ooh, very, very we do good. well, See, sir. I, I'm going to start judging you now. It's uh, not I have to guess what you've done is what you have selected needs to be what I'm guessing. That's that's the order of things from now on. So you you have uh, failed in your mission, Dan. That's fair. That's true. That's true. The sincerity, or rather the uh, severity of that uh, kind of statement was made all the more by you kind of gesturing at me with a plucked beard hair, really no, kind it's of a, emphasized. It's a small piece of resin that I'm holding. Oh, it's a piece of resin? Yes. Why are you... Why are you twiddling about with a small piece of resin. Um, well, basically, I was casting up loads of stuff uh, in my shop this uh, afternoon, and I've got mm. loads of little bits of resin still on the desk, basically. My one at the moment is these magnets. I've been magnetizing bases, so I'm forever oh. fiddling with magnets at the desk, contemplating what it might be like to eat them. Uh, Not good, is the I answer. believe. No. Mm. no, no. If you're going to eat a magnet, definitely don't eat two magnets. That's the... Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. the trick. Or uh, commit and do loads all at once. I think some yeah, of them will, yeah, yeah. I think if they're all stuck together to begin with, not that anyone should follow this advice, I imagine that's safer than having one ingesting it and then sometime later having another one. That's, I think, when they get you. That's true. That's true. Definitely, if they've got to go in, do them all at once, I guess. <laughs> don't, uh, <laughs> but obviously don't do anything at all, uh, listeners at home, no, obviously. No, People highly, know. highly do not encourage. In fact, you know, safety warning, everybody, don't eat magnets. It's Unless you want to go way. to A&E and have a very uh, horrible time. I don't think you, I mean, if you make it that far, I imagine if you consume multiple magnets, just, you know, because, I mean, again, as I play around with these magnets, they pull together very quickly. I could yeah. imagine that inside my body shooting around like a, Great there, that would be that would leave a lot of holes, I imagine. Could do, yeah. Holes where you don't want holes. That's uh, that's to be sure. Anyway, uh, we have a five star review, Phil. If you've uh, if if you're quite done, I haven't forgotten. Yeah, we can carry on now. Yeah, we can carry on. So this one uh, actually is anonymous user uh, via Audible.com. However, Phil, you'll be happy to hear they have left us an at I assume Instagram hand- handle. Ooh. Which is Snozberry Paints. Uh, Snozberries, <laughs> obviously, being a reference to uh, the BFG, uh, which stands for Phil. Uh, big Friendly Giant. That's correct. The Big Friendly Giant, not the Big Gun. Yeah, yes. there we go. Not exactly. that. No, no. Anyway, yes. So Snozberry Paints has left us a five star review via audible.com. And if you would like to be like Snozberry Paints, and leave us a uh, review on places like Audible, maybe iTunes, Facebook, as Phil speculated, could happen. Uh, you need only do so, and maybe one day you will appear here in the five-star review segment being taught the importance of not digesting magnets or other metal objects, I imagine, although maybe there is something out there that is metallic that can be consumed, but I not know of it, so I shan't speculate. Uh, additionally... We have patrons, and we love and appreciate all our patrons. And if you would uh, be so kind and are able to support us via Patreon, uh, we massively appreciate uh, and respect you for it. Not a word that's used very often towards the patrons, but I, I think they deserve respect, don't you? They're like Golden Grahams. They deserve respect. There's a 90s uh, commercial that is probably not stood the test of time uh but thank you to all our patrons you are all uh the most wonderful example of human beings uh and uh, we appreciate and respect you greatly and lastly there is merchandise perhaps you would like to adorn yourself with some lookout sir merchandise I actually saw phil uh not lookout sir ma- merchandise but someone uh wearing the fixed bayonets shirt uh at beachhead that was a nice little moment oh my one yeah yeah, I saw wow. a guy wearing that. Well, they're exceedingly rare because um, I only did them for a limited time to like a handful of patrons. So I think there are probably four in the world, including mine. Well, there we go. 
So that go. is rare. Well, I saw right. one guy wearing one of them. So they are. I hope, me. I hope you said hello, but I guess you did. I did. I did, did say hello. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I shan't name the name. Uh, just you know, in case they don't want to be named, well, they probably wouldn't mind being named James. It was. It was James. Oh, James. Hello, James. If you're listening, well done. There you go. There you go. Good old James. Um. And yeah, that's all of it, really, in terms of the shilling. Uh, let's get on with uh, talking about this five star review uh, from Snozberry Paints. Simply the best 40k podcast. Five stars for, because it is audible, overall performance and story. There you go, Phil. What a wondrous world, eh? Oh, well, we do like to do well at storytelling. We do like to do well at the storytelling. Dan and everyone's good buddy Phil deliver an absolute gem in nearly every episode. The long listen time is great for car rides when you can't travel in a crow's manner, and they forecast GW's upcoming releases like Nosferatu himself. Ooh, this is a, a recent review, Phil. Hitting us with all of the uh, the fillers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, in all seriousness, give these guys a listen. They are a core part of my hobby experience. And I never miss an episode. Keep up the good work, guys. And thank you from at Snodsberry Paints. And Snodsberry Paints, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to leave us this five-star review on Audible. It means a lot to us. Uh, we hugely appreciate uh, the kind words uh, and the obvious uh, statements that let us know that you are truly a real fan, an actual you know, person who pays a lot of attention. Uh, and to emphasize all of that, uh, we will, of course, be going on to Instagram and looking at your stuff and giving you a little bit of an Instagram review segment before the outro. But before all of that, Phil will say thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Snozzberry Paints. That was a very kind, deep and thoughtful uh, five-star review. Uh, you are clearly a very long-time listener, if you're making reference to A Crow's Manor, and a more recent listener for the Nosferatu. Very good. I, I enjoyed those. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing what your Instagram counts holds for us in the outro. Absolutely. But before we get to that, let's talk about Dark Angels transitional noise. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. In this part of the podcast, myself and Phil are going to talk about what, Phil? Uh, the Dark Angels, I believe. The Dark Angels and or their new Codex supplement within the confines of Warhammer 40,000's 10th edition. Ooh, exciting, isn't it? Uh, yeah, Yes, I mean, more exciting for you because you collect them and have the book because uh, you got the fancy box set, uh, whereas I have neither. That's fair. That's fair. Probably worth saying, I mean, yes, I was able to get hold of Deathwing Assault. Uh, thank you to the friendly local game store uh, for facilitating that. Definitely a appropriate reminder to all of you out there who are hoping to get your hands on new things. Definitely worth taking the time uh, to build relationships with your friendly local game stores, even games workshop stores or Warhammer stores, as they are these days, um, can be incredibly useful in that regard because... You know, at the end of the day, yes, having to play, pay the full Games Workshop price is slightly more of a bitter pill to swallow than paying the Element Games price. Um, but it's certainly, certainly, is that me pronouncing that correctly? Anyway, it is a lot less uh, than what you end up paying if you try and then buy it on eBay, it's fair to say. So, uh, yeah, highly encourage all of you to uh, be friendly to your uh, local game stores. And you, like I could secure, secure yourself a Deathwing Assault, perchance. Um, although, by all accounts, it was very, very popular. Sold out very quickly, didn't it, Phil? Uh, I, I assume so. I think everything sells out very quickly at the moment, um, which is a conversation topic in its own right. Absolutely. Certainly Warhammer 40,000 stuff anyway, which, uh, yeah, the Age of Sigmar and uh, Heresy stuff tends to be a lot more available a lot longer. But, uh, yeah, AOS and... Seemingly old world, although we've not really had a chance to put old world to the test yet because there was the original hype that was said to have been poorly supported by Games Workshop from a stock perspective. So I guess we'll soon see whether old world is as equally troubling as the uh, 
months and years roll on with that one. Um, but all the same, yeah, uh, anything 40K, thanks in part to all those brilliant scalpers out there, is uh, increasingly more difficult to get hold of. What a treat, eh? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. God bless them and their desire to make uh, additional funds, uh, you know. What a world we live in, eh? I oh, know, a joy. It is a joy, much like the Dark Angels Codex Supplement. So a um, couple of really interesting things about Dark Angel Codex Supplement is, number one, it is the first Codex Supplement of Warhammer 40,000's 10th edition. Um, so a lot of really interesting things are happening with Codex Supplement Dark Angels that weren't necessarily as common in older editions, and we'll get into that in a moment. Um, and the other interesting thing as well, actually, is it's the first big box set release of this edition where we have a big box with a book in it and a game that hasn't yet accepted its existence. So uh, if you, like I, have managed to secure a Death Wing Assault box, you are now in this interesting place where you're not really sure what you're supposed to be doing because... For all intents and purposes, we're still using the index for Dark Angels. Uh, the points, as per the field manual, are based on index Dark Angels. Um, and it's fair to say the points within Codex Supplement Dark Angels are quite expensive versus what you see within the field manual variant. So it is an interesting one. Uh, it's interesting to see how Games Workshop were treating these kind of releases. Previously, in the ninth edition, this sort of stuff would happen, but because of how points worked in that edition, it never felt quite so disjointed, whereas now we're in a sort of weird one where these books come out, and it does feel like the differential between where uh, the published points within the printed document kind of don't bear any like resemblance to what we're seeing in the manual. So it becomes a really weird thing where you're like, so I really taking Deathwing Knights that are worse than the Deathwing Knights in the index, but for some reason cost 55 points more. I, I don't understand. It's a very, it's a very interesting wibbly thing that we didn't really see as prevalent in ninth edition. I don't know if you had a hot take on that, Phil. Um, I think normally, because I think a lot of the conversation, I guess, could be had with the exception of points, because in before you almost could mitigate it with power level and mm. say we're playing power level because we don't need to worry about points. If you're doing a casual game, mm. uh, mm. points, uh, well, so normally, yeah, for a tournament, it's basically you can only run the old version until mm. the new codex is available to everyone and on general release. As you were saying, it's currently not because it's just in a big box for people that get, could get hold of it. So if you were one of those people, you got the box, you've got this codex. So in theory, at home, if you're or playing with your friends quite casually, you could use the new codex. But I guess, as you say, the question is, do you use the uh, the latest balanced data slate points or are you using the codex? Technically, it should be the codex, because normally the precedence is whatever is the latest publication overrides the previous one, whether that's digital or not. And potentially when the codex is out, what we see is the digital points will update to reflect closer the codex points. But as you say, they might be completely separate now. The points in the codex are almost there just to advertise that there's an app and there's an online space where the points exist and that's really where you need to go. So, yeah, it'd be quite interesting to see, because as you're saying, it sounds like there's quite a big points difference in some of them. Is it generally reflective that these new units are better, although you're saying they're worse? So that's that's interesting. Yeah, so Deathwing Knights specifically, I can point to that as the specific example. They are worse uh, in, well, they're worse what, in damage output. Oh, right? okay. Because I was going to say, what makes them worse? Is it the stats or is it 
because it might be the stats are worse, but the faction specific rules that you now get access to make them better overall, potentially, or the stratagems. Uh, yes, or perchance, the perchance. Enhancements. So it might be that kind of combo of stuff yeah. that makes them better than just the pure index version alone. If well, they're that like, does, clever enough to do that. That does create some interesting variables in and of itself, but are probably not really massively worth going into too deep. Although I do imagine that they use the points costs of enhancements to try and kind of mitigate that that variable of mm. is this unit stronger in this type of detachment. I'm pretty confident that GW is I, I don't know. I don't know how the 40k rules writing team determine points. And points really at the moment are, as we've spoken about before, horrible. Um, because it has to ac- uh, account for a vast uh, amount of variables um, mm. and does a very poor job of doing it, um, which is why we see things like the uh, crisis suits or the um, Tau battle suits being so expensive, um, although expensive if you're taking the worst version of them, but being probably a little bit too cheap if you're taking the best version of them. Um, so it becomes this really weird uh, scenario. But yeah, basically, Deathwing Knights at the moment, as per the field manual, I believe are 235 points, and you can take them in a unit of 10. So you can take a unit of 10 Deathwing Knights for 470 points, um, whereas Deathwing Knights in the new Codex Supplement Dark Angels can only be taken as a five-man unit, and costs 290 points. Uh, They've changed the weapon loadout, so you can either have a sword, which has a lot of more, well, some more attacks, so basically like five attacks, which is, I think, one more than the mace uh, that they had previously. Um, So you can have like five attacks, um, but they're all uh, like straight five, damage one. In fact, let me clarify what I'm saying, because I've got the book in my hand, so I may as well be completely 100% confident in the words that I'm using. Deathwing Knights. Yeah, so you can take the uh, great... Oh, no, not the great weapon of the Unforgiven. Mace. There we go. Just, I think it's just power weapon, yeah. Uh, the Nightmaster's great weapon of the Unforgiven. Oh, okay, so the Nightmaster has that. All Deathwing Knights uh, can just have a power weapon, yeah. So literally, they all come with sh- uh, five attacks, weapon skill two plus, which is good. Strength six, minus two, one damage. It's it's pretty pitiful. When you consider that the uh, Mace of Absolution, as per the index, uh, was like four attacks, weapon skill two plus, strength six, minus two, I want to say, three damage, right? Like it was like a mm. really powerful weapon, and now it's just a bit meh, and you can only take them in units of five. Uh, they've got all the same rules. Otherwise, they've still got the minus one damage. Um Actually, the only difference now is is they do also have teleporter Homer added to them. But yeah, the point is is that like yeah, I think we're in this weird thing where historically you're absolutely right, Phil. Like the book would come into existence and you'd have it, and for your casual games, you'd use the book um, because it would supersede all other things, and that was broadly true. But this is the first time where you're looking at a game system where the points are already quite wildly different. So, like, for example, if you wanted to take a Deathwing Terminator squad, a Deathwing Terminator squad is exactly the same as a regular Terminator squad now, except it's got a Watcher in the Dark um, as as an add-on, which is basically once per battle in any phase, um you get feel no pain four plus against mortal wounds. Mortal wounds are so rare in 40 K. I mean, they do happen, but they're pretty rare. Uh, But you get the watcher in the dark, which gives you the four plus against mortal wounds once per game. And uh, you get the addition of a plasma cannon, but the plasma cannon by all accounts is not as good as a cyclone missile launcher, which was a weapon option that you already have. But yeah, the regular Terminator squad. (laughs) is 185 points. But if you take a Deathwing Terminator squad, which literally the only difference between the Deathwing Terminator squad and a regular Terminator squad that is meaningful is the Watcher in the Dark. That is a 20-point tax to take Deathwing. I I, I guess here's the thing. That it was done when 
devastating wounds were mortal wounds. So therefore, it's more meaningful. Now, with the change to custodies on the balance stage to slate, because they had a similar ability with a four plus against mortal wounds, it now Mm. also includes devastating wounds. So once the normal codex is out, and then a few weeks later, we get the sort of FAQ document for it, it could be that with the Watcher in the Dark also gets it against devastating Ooh. wounds as well, which would go back to doing its original function and therefore justify the points. But obviously we don't know that because we've got to wait for the FAQ to come out. So that's just sort of speculation, but it seems like a likely thing to happen based on the custodies precedence. It's a really interesting um, hypothesis, they feel, and I do appreciate it. And I think you are right. Like if they do then have future updates, uh, which further clarify or, or justify some of this stuff. That's great. Um, it's, it's it's an interesting state of affairs, though, isn't it? Like, I, I know this has kind of become the norm across 8th and ninth edition and now 10th edition, but 10th edition sort of more so than most, although early 8th edition definitely felt like this as well. But, like, it's it's weird, isn't it? Because, obviously, 10th is such a new game, and it's not iterative like how um, ninth edition was to eighth edition. It feels like you know they're releasing and selling stuff, yet they've really not actually determined what this game really fully is at the moment in terms of some of the the ru- rules nuances. So it churns up all these really weird problems where it's like, oh, here's a book with some rules, and it's like, well, these rules are practically worthless. Ah, yeah, because we changed everything. Well, don't worry. We'll get around to FAQing it one day. It's like, it's very odd. It's very- yeah, I, I, this is a problem I've always had where the book can often get invalidated before or before its release because of updates to the, the balanced data slate in general that happens. And it could be it's sort of bad timing from the yeah. you know the last one. Although the changes to the mortal wounds to devastating happened in the previous one. So that would have been six months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the print run time is apparently around six months anyway. So that would sort of make sense if it, if this was written before the prior, uh, balance data slate update. And that's just inherently always going to be a problem with books. Um, if they went to a digital only method and there was like effectively no lead time for printing and distributing, cause it's like you're just buying a digital thing it could be a lot more reactive and instantaneous. And this book could have, in theory, been updated to reflect the very latest uh, balanced state slate. And then potentially, as it's all digital, it always gets updated in line with wherever wherever updates for games going to happen. Mm. But And that sounds great. That sounds like a great world to be in. But people like books and Games Workshop like to sell books. So I think we're sort of forever stuck with it. <laughs> this is a problem. Well, indeed. I, again... We were never in older editions, sort of seventh edition backwards, because of the universal special rule system. You, you, it didn't happen so prevalently, but but also lack every, of updates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, also lack of updates. Well, that was a crazy thing, right? When Dark Angels launched in, um, so Dark Angels were one of the early fifth edition codexes, I want to say. Um, so I think Dark Angels came out, then they did Space Marines, um, and they had this weird problem where like Dark Angels came out. And they were like the first Space Marine book. And then they did the Space Marine book. And then the Space Marine book kind of null and voided like loads of Dark Angel stuff. And then by like the end of fifth edition, it was literally like, well, I want to do a Space Marine army. It's like, oh, Dark Angel is cool. But everything in it is worse than in the regular Space Marine book. So I'll just take Space Marines and paint them Dark Angel colors, but just run them (laughs) as regular Marines. And the same was true of like, I remember like Blood Angels through like seventh edition had the most expensive scouts for a really pointless series of reasons. Cause their book came out again. I want to say it like the end of sixth edition start seventh edition and their scouts for some reason were worse and cost more. And then every other scout unit cost less and was better. And it was like, what? And it's just like, well, they were going to be this many points when we released the blood angel book, but then we did space reads and figured nah, they should be 10 points less. So, yes, okay. yeah. <laughs> like, I think that's that's the flip side of if you only having a physical medium to distribute it. Because I mean, yeah. even in seventh edition, they I think they did like one P 
PDF update towards the very end of the edition yes. or a couple yeah, of, yeah, 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 and that was like a strange new world when that happened and yeah prior to that it's like well what does it have in the book because that's what you get and there were as you say these discrepancies between things that sort of exist across several codexes but sometimes stats are different and you're like oh that shouldn't be the case but was um yes so yeah very interesting um i guess enough I of that was- should we oh god yeah, yeah, I was just remember. I think it was the the Blood Angel Scout was tough as free for some reason, and then all the other ones got to be tough as four because they were like, oh yeah, they are still Space Marines. So, yeah, like, yes, because I guess they maybe loaded it because they were were like they're not in power armor. Yeah, or yeah, they're not fully they like, Space Marines more tough or as free or something. Some, yeah. yeah, who knows? Who knows? But yeah, so um, getting into the Dark Angel book itself. So uh, Codex supplements historically uh, have always been really interesting. Um, Again, in older editions, we had a lot more supplements. Uh, there were a lot. There was a lot more literature that kind of supplemented things. Uh, even in ninth edition, we had the Warzone series, um, which added a lot of supplementation to a variety of armies. Um, so you know, although Space Marines quite exclusively receive meaningful supplement books and have done across uh, multiple editions. There have been multiple mechanics used by Games Workshop to distribute supplement type materials. White Dwarf as well. Uh, White Dwarf yep. often had a, a an army supplement in it. Um, so yeah, this is the thing. So you know, supplements historically, um, you know, have existed and have amplified the offering that your army has. What's always been the case in the past is it always felt like a supplement was giving you something but it was restricting you in some way, right? Like it was a, you want to be a dark angel army. Therefore you must use dark angel stuff. Uh, You can't take regular space marine stuff and just, you know, sprinkle in the best bits of dark angels. You got the good, but you also got the bad. If there was any bad to hand around, what is unique now in 10th edition and what we're seeing is what, Codex Dark Angels is is just an extra set of tools, an extra set of uh, units and pieces that can amplify your existing offering. There is absolutely no restriction to layering these Dark Angel units and their rules into your existing Space Marine collection. Now, Keywords are still a thing, so I can't take Azrael and Kelgar alongside each other because one is a Dark Angel, the other is an Ultramarine. Everything needs to be a Dark Angel to appear in a Dark Angel's army, but I can still take a First Company detachment from the Space Marine Codex and then layer in as much of the Dark Angel stuff that I want to have in it. Um... And there are actually some really, really strong components within this book that really amplify what's going on in Space Marine. So this is this is the strangely unique thing. There was a strange instance recently of a Black Templar player running Black Templars, but they had a librarian in their army. And everyone was like, a, a librarian in a, in, a, in a Black Templar army? And it's like, oh, yeah, but I'm not running the Black Templar detachment. I'm running this detachment. And it's only the detachment that says I can't take a librarian. So here's That's my librarian. Weird. <laughs> That's yeah. Weird. Yeah. Well, we've just seen it in Age of Sigma, haven't we? Like, because obviously in Age of Sigma, lots of corn players were still supplementing in either Bellacore or some other like sorcerer well, wizard. Zinch, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Zinch. And then obviously they've come along again. I mean, fair enough. But if you do that, there is a negative. So in the case of Age of Sigma, if you're if a friendly wizard is trying to cast a spell and your general is a corn general, or you just have corn blades of corn in your army on a five plus, you can't do your own spell, um, which is a really interesting mechanic that obviously disincentivizes you from doing it. Will we see stuff like that with things like the Black Templars to kind of circumnavigate some of this stuff? It would be quite funny. It was like you bring a librarian to the battlefield, uh, and if it's near any you know Black Templar units. It has to roll saves or something because they're just punching, stabbing him in the back <laughs> as they're as he's walking along. It's like, oh, you're not, you're not correct. Um, I don't know, I don't know what they do with it. But the point is, is that the toolkit that they have created within Space Marines 
with the addition of the supplement is quite interesting. Um, and it creates this really strange kind of cognitive dissonance between the fluff of 40K and the game of 40K. And it's fair to say that I feel like the bridge, the gap between hobby and game has only widened with this new um, ethos. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, Phil. Um, yeah, I think I think you're right because the game inherently always had very restrictive game mechanics in the past, whether that was your... Um, was it cats? What was the the the, the formations? Um, the combined the, arms detachment. The CAD, yes, yes, it was the cat. Yeah. So so that was you know you had to have like one HQ and two troops or three troops, whatever it might be, plus a limited number of like HQs or elites. And then in eighth edition, that sort of expanded. So you had different types of detachments that you could choose from that then gave you access to more or less of those um, uh, unit types. Um, and then you had things like the Allies Matrix at one point where it's like, yes, you can, uh, you know, you can be a space marine, but you could have an elder unit with your army, but they wouldn't be, they wouldn't get on very well. So you had to keep a certain distance away or something bad might happen. Uh, or you could have two space marines and they might get on. But then, you know, thematically, if you had Minotaurs and another space marine unit, they wouldn't get on or, you know, space wolves never got on with like ultramarines, stuff like that. So you always had these like historical law and themes, precedents, uh, sort of throughout the game system. And that sort of helps you play the game in a much more thematic way. Like you see the narrative because it's within the very structure of the game itself. Uh, the idea of, I'll just play what you want. You know, you've got a restriction of, you've got to have a character and you've got to have, you know, well, that's pretty much it. Like you've that got to it, have mate. a, that's a character and you've yeah. got to have, you know, a, a unit of something right uh and that, so it's great th- for the the freedom to build and do whatever you want but because there are no constraints you don't see any of the the theming it's like yes the black templars detachment does say you can't have a librarian but as you say you can sort of circumnavigate that because of the the freedom they've g- given you within it as well so and you sort of see that with war gear choices and stuff like that. Everything's been narrowed down to the point where you just build what the model comes with and you don't get any other choices. So there's almost, there's, there's literally no reason to ever convert a model if you don't want to anymore. And that could be seen as a positive, but for me, it always feels like a bit of a negative because I like the incentive to see something and want to create it rather than just go out and buy the box that has it already. Um, but you know, that's just my personal choice, but yeah, I I do see what you mean about the, the theme is sort of, yeah, being eroded away from the game itself because of the freedoms of the game. But I I bet you there's other people that feel the opposite and they, they love that they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And I, here's the thing. I don't dislike the fact that you have flexibility. I think flexibility is important. I think being able to take the army you want to take and not to be restricted by the fact that your army is painted one color, right? I, I, mm. One of our very early podcasts was us talking about, is it okay to paint Roberto Gilliman red and chuck him into a, uh, a blood angel army? And my answer to it was absolutely like at the end of the day, if you want to run your red space Marines as ultramarines for a game, and you've got a red Roberto Gilliman and you're running them as the rules for ultramarines, but they just happen to be painted as blood angels. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with you rocking up and being like, oh, I want to run my Blood Angels as Iron Hands today. And I've got all the tanks and all the minis, but they're all beautifully painted as Blood Angels. I genuinely have always been frustrated by the way that that problem specifically impacts Space Marine players. I feel like it was one of the crazy things that really wasn't fair to people who effectively felt like they were being punished for being passionate about a specific chapter, a specific legion. Mm. Um, again, it really sticks in my mind, but in early 8th edition, I had this chat with a guy who was a regular at um, Games Workshop Warhammer World events, uh, and he had a Crimson Fist army. And the reason why that resonated with me was because at the time, I too had a Crimson Fist army, um, and uh, you know we would discuss the delights of running Crimson Fist. And he said to me, it was like, 
does feel really annoying, though, that because of a decision I made six years ago to paint these guys dark blue with red hands, I'm now being punished and my army is weaker just by virtue of a painting decision. And it's like... Yes, because yeah, Crimson Fist was renowned for having quite a bad sub-faction rule, I think, in 8th yeah. edition. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I do get it. Weirdly, I think with Red Gilliman, I would say no. Personally, I'm like, <laughs> I would say paint him blue, but include him yeah. in your Blood Angels army yeah. is fine, because thematically he could be, for whatever reason, end up leading a, a small unit that isn't ultra I mean it's like yeah that seems totally plausible and yeah. a similar thing i mean this is completely off topic from dark angels but uh back in sixth edition and seventh edition uh as a guard player you could take pask he's like he's uh cadian but it doesn't really matter you can include him in any army so i always had a krieg tank commander that in my eyes was a Krieg uh, commander, wasn't Pask, but that was just the data sheet I was using to represent a person of equivalent power to Pask. And then when 8th edition came along, it was like, oh, yeah, you can't run him anymore. Uh, yeah. It was like, oh, uh, okay, because I don't have Cadians in my army. I've, I'm, I'm keyworded out of uh, being able to take him. That was a bit disappointing because like, there's no one of equivalent to him for my sub faction as you say i'm being penalized because i don't have a particular sub faction at least for guardsmen you sort of have a bit more freedom now well also past doesn't exist in the game so you know that's that's another way around <laughs> it <laughs> rip um yeah like, again i'll just say it for the sake of saying it i think fifth edition had the best approach uh which was that um because in my uh, my space Marine army at the time I was running uh, Angels of Redemption, which is a, a Dark Angel successor, but I would just mix in different Space Marine characters into it. So I had uh, Angels of Redemption, uh, Vulcan Heston. Uh, I had uh, Chaplain Cassius, and I would regularly run Cassius and Heston together um, because Cassius had the combi flamer, uh, so he benefited from all of the buffs that Heston gave them for being salamanders. Key, uh, not keyworded back then, just rules. Um, so there was like lots of nice fun layers you could do with it where you were like, you can layer it in and just take these characters and they add something to your army. It's like if you wanted a tank commander, you could take Sergeant Kronos and you could layer that in and have that. But as you said, Phil, Sergeant Kronos doesn't have to be an ultramarine. It's just a data sheet that could be utilized. Mm. I think that was useful um, and a nice way of kind of blending it, which I suppose in a way... It's kind of what they're doing here, except the difference here is is that it's still a case of if I'm if I took Sergeant Kronos, not that I can because I think he's also been deleted, but if I was to take Sergeant Kronos, well, it's in um, Legend. Legend, I apologise, Legend. Um, which you know, <laughs> tomato, tomato. But um, the the point is is that yeah, like uh, he's still ultraing keyworded, so I, I I couldn't take him and Vulcan Heston, for example. It just doesn't work that way anymore. But that's fine. It is what it is. But it's interesting. And I think that's the thing. What's interesting about this is, is it demonstrates to me that Space Marines will be in a good place throughout this edition because they will get lots of layers, right? Like, we're going to see lots of additional stuff layered on top of Space Marines. Um, again, they're an Imperium faction, so when they finally get around to giving us new rules for like agents and stuff like that, they'll benefit from those. When they finally get around to giving us a new Imperial Knight Codex, they'll benefit from those. Not to mention co Codex Supplement Space Wolves, Blood Angels, Black Templars, maybe even Grey Knights. Again, depends on how they kind of incorporate those in, although I assume Grey Knights will still stay very much their own kind of thing. So yeah, the, the, the point is, is that it's a really interesting uh, piece of kind of uh, portents for uh, what uh, is to come for Space Marines throughout this edition. Um, instinctively, I'm okay with it, um, but I do think it does create an interesting dilemma for them from a balanced perspective because I, weekend before last, was at uh, Beachhead Brawl where I was doing uh, some judging, going around, playing some games, uh, and Dark Angels did very well at it. And that was using Codex Supplement, uh, rather, sorry, uh, Index Supplement uh, Dark Angels. Um, and that was already starting to take on board some of the aspects that, that this kind of only further kind of supports. So 
I think it's really interesting and it really stuck out to me that actually, yeah, these, these supplements kind of enhance Space Marines in a completely different way to how it was before. Um, but yeah, let's talk about Dark Angels specifically, shall we? So mm -hmm. if you were to take Dark Angels and you wanted to take them in a kind of green wing variety format and you were just going to go, I'm going to do a proper Dark Angels army. I'm not going to look at any of the detachments that are in Space Marines. I'm just going to use an Unforgiven Task Force. Well, essentially, the Unforgiven Task Force gives you access to six uh, stratagems, some shared across other detachments, uh, and the detachment rule of Grim Resolve, which is basically when you're battle shocked, you count as uh, one OC rather than zero, um, mm -hmm. which is actually really useful. Um, it's a it's a pretty handy ability. So should you be battle shocked, you'll still be OC one, um, uh, which comes in handy. The restriction of this detachment is uh, your army can only include Dark Angel unit, but it cannot include any uh, uh, Adeptus Astartes units drawn from other chapters. So this detachment is closed off to Ultramarines, Imperial Fists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Enhancement wise, it, it, it's got some enhancements. I'm not going to go through excruciating detail. I'll, I'll go into the strats because they're generally interesting. Sorry, I have a cold at the minute as well. If you just heard me being all snotty, um, so armor of contempt is armor of contempt. You know what that is, Phil? Plus one to mm -hmm. your armor save or minus one to the uh, AP of the attacking mm -hmm. weapon. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely. Uh, Unforgiven fury, battle tactic stratagem, one CP. Use it in your shooting or fight phase. Uh, one attempts to start a unit from your army that has not been selected to shoot or fight until the end of the phase. Weapons equipped with, uh, by models in that unit have lethal hits ability. In addition, if one or more attempted to start units from your army are currently battle shot until the end of the phase, each time model in that unit makes an attack, a successful unmodified hit roll of five scores a critical hit. Now, mm -hmm. this is the recurring gimmick, Phil. Basically, it's a really odd detachment because... It wants you to be scared all the time. Wants you to be battle shocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is not a mechanic you can easily lean into. Basically, if you're battle shocked, you're better than if you're not. But it, yeah, you can't force weird. it. But you could have some rock paper scissors where if you're up against like night lords or maybe like a tyranid army that has uh, that triggers a lot of battle shock tests yeah um yeah. then you, yeah you do better against them but yeah you can't inherently make yourself more battle shocked i guess so <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's kind of it basically sort of means like i oh, don't care about casualties too much yeah um, yeah which i suppose kind of speaks to their grim resolve i suppose so mm. um the next one is uh intractable uh one cp uh your movement phase just after an attempt to start a unit from your army uh has fallen back uh that you target that unit uh, until the end of the turn uh your unit is eligible to shoot and declare a charge in the turn in which it fell back so it can fall back and shoot and charge it's really good really handy no extra battle shock shenanigans there mm -hmm. fall back shoot charge uh one cp we also have fire discipline this is another battle tactic stratagem uh it happens in your shooting phase uh, one adept to start a unit from your army that has not been selected to shoot this phase uh, until the end of the phase. Ranged weapons equipped by models uh, in your unit have the assault heavy and ignores cover ability. So that's really useful because um, essentially what that means is, is that you can advance and shoot with no penalty while also ignoring cover, which is very handy in the game mm. of edition. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not sure what unit you'd use it on though. True. It, not, there isn't a unit that like immediately sticks out to me um, as really kind of reap the benefits. I mean, maybe Deathwing or regular Terminator squads, I guess. Yeah, because if you're going to be stationary, you get your plus one from it being heavy, or you're yeah just charging and assaulting or advancing and assaulting. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more likely that you're going to want the benefit of remaining stationary than you're going to necessarily. Well. It's a bit of column A, a bit of column B. The thing is, is that so many units, like, you know, the Bolter units, and even, like, the Hellblasters, they already have assault. There's so many, like, they, they seem to have sprinkled those keywords into weapons hmm. all over the place in Space Marine. So, 
If anyone out there has any suggestions about what unit you would prioritise this on, I mean, maybe a Dreadnought. I mean, Dreadnoughts don't have Assault or Heavy, so that'd probably be quite terrifying. True. Is it any inf- any unit, not infantry unit? Uh, one Adeptus Astartes unit. So it oh, yeah, so it be... could be a vehicle. Um, yeah, but be lo- a lots of vehicles tend to have heavy weapons, but probably not Assault. Well, they do, but they so don't have the heavy yet. keyword. Hmm. Almost no vehicle, um, like a heavy bolter on a vehicle, almost never has the heavy keyword. Oh, interesting. And I think that only the only exceptions to that are things like those outer line of sight, like mortars and things that, that the guards yes, get. I, I think that they've, um, yeah, I think for vehicles, they tend to take the heavy off of it because the vehicle kind of keywords just override. Yeah. Well, what vehicle does tends to override the fact that it needs to be heavy, so it doesn't have it baked in. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got Grim Retribution. Uh, your opponent's shooting bay is just after uh, an enemy unit has shot uh, one attempt to start a unit from your army that had one or more models destroyed as a result of that unit's attacks. Uh, your unit can shoot as if it were your shooting phase, but it must target only any unit that just attacked it and can only do so if that any unit is an eligible target. So shooting back at people for one CP, pretty handy. That's good. That is good, to be fair. Um, and then lastly, for two CP, battle tactic stratagem, unbreakable lines. Uh, your opponent's charge phase, just our enemy unit, ends a charge move. One adept as a starter unit from your army within engagement range of that enemy unit until the end of the turn, each time an attack targets your unit, Subtract one from the wound roll. Um, so this used to be better because it used to be minus one damage. I'm fairly confident of that. Um, but minus one to wound for two That's seconds. actually really good, I think. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty handy. The good thing about it as well, just to remember, that's a battle tactic strategy, right? So this you detachment... You get it for free if you you've got a free. captain or something, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so, you know, zero CP, give yourself minus one to wound. Uh, again, if you're looking at something like a Terminator squad, already pretty strong toughness. Mm. Maybe they were wounding you on fives somehow, some way. Um, again, can be done on vehicles as well. So if they're targeting a Dreadnought, that mm. Dreadnought could be w- being wounded on sixes, which is... Is it, um, is it only after you've charged, though? Uh, no, after your opponent charges. Oh, you. so it is. Okay, all right. So it's quite a good defensive bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's in response. Nice. So it's any adept as a status unit. Um, what's interesting about that one, Phil, just to say, I feel like before, and I only ran this detachment a couple of times, so forgive me if I forget uh, the exact details, but they definitely removed a lot of the battle shock stuff from it. There's only one strat here that is battle shock related, which is... Different from what it was before, but to its benefit, actually. Uh, credit where credit's due, I was going to look at this and kind of be like, ah, you just take a Gladius task force thing and be done with it. But actually, there's some interesting stuff in there from a strategy. So, so this is the updated index detachment. Correct. And yes, then there are, are there other detachments as well? There, there are, yeah, there are. Okay. There's two more. There's two more. Oh, so, so there's just well three in total. Three in total, yeah. So you've got the Inner Circle Task Force. The and you've one. got and I the guess there's a raven of hunters. Yeah, a raven yeah. wingy one. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, cool, nice. Yeah, I mean the only thing that I will say about uh, the um, what's it called again, the Unforgiven Task Force is is lacking any redeploy, um, which is massive in this game. If you want a good detachment, you need something that lets you move out of sequence. Um, that's like yes, the best. I guess uh, teleport homers on your terminators allow you to do it. That's obviously a, a data sheet level rather than detachment level. Um, yeah, and I yeah. take it there's no enhancements that allow a, a unit to do that. Well, let's have a quick let's have a quick look. So shroud of heroes, uh, raw d six at the end of the phase on two plus. So basically, it's a two plus get back up again thing. Um, so it's pretty good. Uh, so yeah, first time the barrier is destroyed, roll a d6 on a two plus set up the barrier back on the battlefield as close as possible to where it was destroyed and not within engagement range. Blah blah blah. 
Uh, stubborn tenacity. Oh, how, uh, how many wounds does it get back up with? Uh, three wounds remaining. Oh, it's so pretty good. It's pretty. It's pretty reasonable. Yeah. Uh, stubborn tenacity. Uh, while the bearer is leading a unit, each time a model in that unit makes an attack, add one to the hit roll. If that unit is below starting strength, add one to the wound roll, uh, as well as the uh, as well if that unit is battle shot and below its starting strength. Okay. So that's a weird battle shock thing. So basically, yeah, if you're battle shocked, you get plus one to wound in addition to plus one to hit. Mm, yeah, niche. Uh, here's the thing: space means can get battle shocked a lot more than you. They can. They definitely they, they do. would in previous editions. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got weapons of the first legion. Add one to the attack strength damage characteristic of the bearer's melee weapons while the bearer is battle shocked. Add two. To its attack, strength, and damage characteristic. Again, I'm scared. Ah! It's just, yeah, it's very odd. It's a very weird. Well, uh, it, is the, it is the grim resolve aspect of it. It's like, even though it's not, it's less about being scared because of the, you failed battle shot, but it's more like I'm weak and damaged and on death's door, but I'm still fighting on harder and stronger, I think is the way I would read into it. No, I like that, Phil. That's 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 definitely more space marine than what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. um, Run away! <laughs> and then lastly, we've got uh, an ancient model only. Uh, while the bearer is leading a unit, models in that unit have feel no pain six plus ability. While that unit is battle shocked, it becomes feel no pain four plus. Wow. My god! My god! Sure, sure. Do you take that on a Terminator ancient? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, and. Uh, 10-man unit of uh, Assault Terminators because at the moment you probably wouldn't waste your time taking a 10-man unit of um, Death... Well, you can't take a 10-man unit of Death Wing Knights for a start. So, yeah, the Assault Terminators are a lot more bang for your buck, uh, especially if they're all rocking Feel No Pain, um, Feel No Pain 4+, plus while Battleshocked. Mm. Yeah. But then to induce Battleshock would definitely take some doing. True. Um, yeah, I, I guess it, once you'd almost lean into having like full squad complements as much as possible to make your efficiencies when you are battle shocked. Yes, hundred percent. If that was the route you were going down, that is the way that you'd want to take it. All right, that's that one. Now we'll talk inner circle, the inner circle task force. That being uh, the detachment that. As lots of Terminators, right, Phil? Yes. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yes, if you say so. I mean, that sounds like the sort of thing. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, or although it's a little bit wibbly now because technically uh, the Fallen have, some at least, been forgiven and become the Risen, uh, otherwise known as the uh, Inner Circle Companions, uh, as they are now. But um, they, they 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 say they don't know what they are. Oh yes, sorry. Yes, they're a, they're a great mystery. Um, mm. But but here's the thing, right? Like, so it's, it's a weird thing, right? Because I mean, for a part, I kind of don't really. Cut, I mean, but then the lion was always a bit secretive. I suppose that was its kind of deal. So I guess the idea that some parts of his chapter don't know that other parts of his chapter are the things that they're looking for. Um, it's kind of, I suppose, in keeping with the sorts of silly silliness that the lion might participate in, although it does often feel very strange. But whatever. The point yeah. is, is that the inner circle... Oh. Well, I was going to say, it does make you wonder if Cypher will become arisen or stay fallen. I mean, who knows? Maybe Cypher is a... Epic hero of olden days. You never know. Secret secrets. Um, anyway, the point is, is that, yeah, basically uh, circles around the Death Wings, so specifically the Terminators. Um, so the detachment rule is at the start of your command phase, select one objective marker until the start of your next command phase. That objective marker is your vowed objective marker. Each time a Death Wing infantry unit from your army makes an attack that targets a unit, within range of the vowed objective marker, add one to the wound roll. Ooh. I mean, it's all right. I mean, it's not well, extraordinary. Plus, plus one to wound, I think, is very strong in a game. 
Um, yes, yeah, yeah, it is strong. It is strong, but it's one objective that they have to be within range of, and then yeah, plus one to wound for only Deathwing infantry. Yes, but I assume if you're taking this one, your whole army's Deathwing infantry, right? Or a vast yes. majority of it. Like you're just going to have lots and lots of Terminators. So going, I'm going to come down and shift you off of this one objective. Like it's very aggressive in the fact that you pretty much, well, I guess you could use it defensively, but realistically, you're more likely to use it uh, offensively. Pick an objective that you want to take off your opponent, chuck a load of Terminators on it, and yeah. smash them up. But you're right. If, if your opponent's kind of clever and has a lot of its maybe tougher or keyer units not on the objective, then you're never mm-hmm. going to get this benefit, right? Yeah. Yeah. And certainly, obviously, when you know what your opponent uh, ability is, i.e. plus one to wound for things within range of an objective, um, I guess, you know, you keep, like, the big scary stuff off of objectives and you use, like, chaff units to hold the objectives. It's like, oh, plus one to wound these cultists. It's like, well, I'm yes. wounding them on threes anyway, <laughs> but I suppose yeah. um, twos. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it. Or, funnily enough, if you had something that you could give, uh, like, sticky objectives to, so you're like, I'm not even on the objectives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. T Anyway, uh, the enhancements to these guys is uh, Champion of the Deathwing, so Deathwing model only. Uh, melee weapons equipped by the bearer have lethal hits ability, and each time the bearer makes a melee attack, uh, if it is within range of a vowed objective marker, a critical hit is scored on a, mod- a modified hit roll of 5+. plus. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it seems all right. Eye of the Unseen, uh, Deathwing model only. Each time... Uh, you target the bearer's unit with a stratagem, roll a d6, adding one. If the bearer is within range of the vowed objective, on a five plus, you gain one command point. Um, so yeah, on a four plus within range of the vowed objective, you get a command point back for targeting a stratagem on this unit. It's all right. Um, again, noting that you could still have a captain in that unit, so you're still targeting, so you spend like, again, if, it's a battle tactic stratagem anyway, zero CP, and then on a four plus, maybe five plus, uh, or rather a five plus, maybe four plus, uh, you get uh, a CP back, which is very handy. Hmm. Um, singular will, definitely model only. Each time the bearer units uh, pile in or consolidates, uh, you can move an additional three. So you basically get a six inch pile in and a six inch consolidate. Um Again, still needing to meet the criteria of both, um, the Consolidate specifically. Um, Again, Consolidation already, at least in the competitive sense, it feels like a lot of people have, or the the collective competitive scene has interpreted, interpreted Consolidating as being like, similar to how it used to be. I saw that a lot and I I didn't really question it because it is now part of the collective wisdom. But my understanding was when I originally read the rule and I should probably go back and read the rule before making this judgment um, because, you know, that's the sort of thing a professional podcaster might try to. In fact, let me read it. Let me read it because I don't want to anger people by doing this wrong, right? So, well, well, I don't think you can just consolidate Willy nilly, you have to. I didn't think so either. Consolidate either onto an objective or into engagement range. But I think the nuance there is even if you're within range of them to begin with, you can still do it. So, yeah, so after this unit has finished making all of its melee attacks, it consolidates. Each time a unit consolidates, you move da, 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 three inches. This is a consolidation move. Uh, a unit must be able to end these moves within... Ga- oh, yeah, so this is a consolidation move. For consolidation purposes... Uh, sorry, to be possible, a unit must be able to end these moves within engagement range of one or more enemy units uh, and in unit coherency uh, if these conditions cannot be... Okay. Uh, oh, fine. So for consolidation to be possible, it must end these moves within engagement range. Okay, fine. Um, and each model in that unit instead make a consolidation towards the close. After doing so, the unit is within range of that objective marker. Okay, so technically, I think they're correct. So basically, yeah, uh, when you're already on an objective marker, basically when you're already on an objective marker, 
Or an engagement range. Or an you engagement can range. consolidate sort of as normal. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's um, the variable. But so if far. you've destroyed a unit uh, and you're not an engagement range or an objective marker, you can't just consolidate any way you want unless no, you no. can get into engagement range or onto an objective marker. That's the one thing, I guess, that they've taken away. But if you, as you say, if you're in combat, you can still do a consolidation move. Yes, yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. No, the thing I was seeing was people doing the move when they were already on an objective. And I, in my head, I was like, but you already are on the objective, therefore you don't need to move. Yes, because- yeah. Personally, I think, yeah, it should. they should have defined it a bit more that if you're not on an objective, you can move on to one. But if you're already yeah. on it, you can't. But I, I can, you know, uh, then you get into the nuance of uh, some models are on it, but not everyone, and you want to get more on there. So it's, yeah, it, it could be a bit of a tricky one. But on the upside, being able to consolidate six inches is actually pretty handy because basically that's quite a lot of extra movement. Um, yeah, to either get into combat or onto an objective. Well, that's the thing. If you consider the pile in as well, right? Like having basically an extra six inches of movement across both pile in and consolidate is really meaningful because within the game, like there's very few places you could go on most setups with an infantry unit where someone in that squad wouldn't be within six of an objective marker. Like the objectives aren't spread out that far. Hmm. So yeah, in theory, um, this is actually quite handy because you can go in, smash stuff up, and then make a six-inch move either back towards an objective that you left behind to go and fight or uh, towards one that was being held by someone else. So that's quite good. And then lastly, Deathwing Assault, uh, models with the Deep Strike ability only. Uh, Deathwing models with the Deep Strike ability only. Uh, The Bearish unit can be set up in Deep Strike ability in the reinforcement step of the first second or third movement phase, regardless of any mission rules. So you can come down turn one. But that is that's one strong. unit with that enhancement. Oh, it's an enhancement. Okay, yeah. No, yeah. oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think that's quite... I mean, that's a very strong ability right there. So that's that's got legs. Um, well, what's fun about it is technically you can uh, do rapid ingress with that as well, turn one, if you're going second. Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So, so you, can, you can come down, maneuver, move in your turn as well. So that's even more of an advantage. The yeah, question is, because obviously there is a part of you that thinks immediately like, oh, take a big 10-man unit and cause a headache with it. But then I suppose, well, it be an 11-man unit with the with the character in it. Do you then potentially go for the 5-man? Or I tell you what I've seen some people doing. Um, I've seen some people starting to take lone characters like it like durable characters in terminator armor and just dropping them down well yeah i guess the benefit of that is you can actually squeeze them in like it's a lot harder to screen out a a single character i mean it's a lot harder to screen out a five-man unit over a 10-man one but yeah single characters are quite nippy so you Mm. could especially if you were using them to like just do secondaries and stuff you could uh yeah use them for that reason yeah um, stratagem wise, you've got the armor of contempt. We all know what that is. Uh, or rather we've already said what it is when we were talking about the previous one. It makes armor better. There you go. Uh, material mastery, which is an epic deed. Uh, it's in the fight phase. Uh, one death wing infantry unit from your army. Uh, there's not been selected to fight this phase until the end of the phase. Each time a model in that unit makes an attack, re-roll a wound roll of one. If your unit is within range of the vowed objective marker, you can re-roll the wound roll instead. It's quite good. One mm-hmm. CP to re-roll wounds. Nice. Plus, you're already getting a plus one to wound as well. Indeed. Indeed. So, yeah, there will definitely be a handful of instances where um, you're already wounding on two, so re-rolling the ones is effectively re-rolling to wound. But, um, yeah, in those instances where you're smashing into a tank or something that you really want to be dead... Mm. Um, yeah, good, good for those tougher things like yeah, knights and vehicles. For sure. Uh, duty unto death. Uh, fight phase after enemy unit has selected its targets. Um, one death wing unit from your army that was selected as the target of one or more of the attacking unit's attacks. 
until the end of the phase each time a model in your unit is destroyed. If that model has not fought this phase, roll a d6, uh, adding one if your unit is in range of the vowed objective, and on a four plus, uh, you can fight uh, back basically. So there you go, four oh, plus fight back, going. three plus if you're on the vowed objective. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, Relic temp- Teleportarium. Uh, one Deathwing unit from your army that is arriving using the Deep Strike ability this phase. Um, okay, so it's a it's the three-inch um, Deep Strike. So you can do Deep Strike outside of three. So oh, the like end of turn, the unit... Hmm? Like Inceptors. Yes, yeah, but you're hmm. not able to declare a charge. So like yeah, Inceptors, same. you can come in hmm. within three or outside of free. So again, that in combination with the Deathwing Assault Enhancement obviously becomes very good, except you're definitely going to want to lean into a unit of Terminators that's shooting as mm. opposed to a unit of Terminators that are charging because obviously you can't charge if yeah. you're arriving within free. Mm. Um, but that's definitely cool. That's got some That's got some legs, I'd say. Nice. That, that does well. Uh, Wrath of the Lion, uh, your charge phase, one Deathwing infantry unit from your army, uh, just ended a charge move, select one enemy unit within engagement range, uh, roll D6 for each model in the unit, add one to the result of the enemy unit in range of the battle objective. Um, for each four plus, the enemy suffers one mortal wound. So basically, if they're within range of the battle objective, for each three plus, they suffer a mortal wound. Yeah, it's all right. I mean, it's basically the Hammer of Wrath stuff that uh, assault. Um, assault Marines get, um, but in this instance, you get it on Terminator squads. So, yeah, big 10 man, 11 man unit, Terminators charges in, uh, and you know, does a bunch of mortal wounds. Not bad, nice, not mm. bad. Uh, and then unmatched fortitude, your opponent's shooting phase just after an enemy unit has selected its targets. One Deathwing infantry unit from your army that was selected as the target of one or more of the attacking unit's attacks. Until the end of the phase, each time an attack targets your unit, its strength characteristic of that attack is greater than your unit's toughness characteristics. Subtract one from the wound rolls. There you go. Um, so, yeah, unmatched fortitude. Mm. That is a battle tactic strategy as well. Um, so, again, captain in unit, uh, that is zero CP. Intriguingly... Well, well also, I was going to say, you can do it twice. You could also do it twice, yeah, because because uh, that's what that captain ability allows you to do is do it for free and do it a second time if you've done it once already. Yes, yeah, yeah. very handy. Um, intriguingly, though, the Inner Circle Task Force only has two battle tactics, so it's got Armor of Contempt and Unmatched Fortitude. Everything else is either a strategic ploy or epic deed, mm. so it is uh, slightly less advantageous in the uh, battle tactic economy that is Space Marine stratagems, but. Um, yeah, overall, I mean, it seems fine. I, personally, I genuinely think the first company um, task force from the regular Space Marine book has better options for Terminators. Um, they don't have the three inch deployment trick and they don't have the turn one deep strike, but they have the redeploy. They've got a lot more kind of durability options. There's just stuff in it that feels like a better fit. I think if I was taking a Deathwing army, I would probably use Inner Circle Task Force just because it feels like the right thing to do. But if I was trying to run it slightly more efficiently, I almost certainly would be running it as a as a first company task force, which is not to say that the first company task force is a good detachment by any stretch of the imagination. Broadly speaking, Space Marine players are the consensus that it's one of the weaker ones. But it feels like it's got a little bit more utility than this, but um, you know, some of it's quite cool though. I like the whole vowed objective thing, but um, again, Inner Circle has uh, once per game reroll all hits or wounds with your um, oath of moment. So I oh, feel yeah. like I just feel like that's just a little stronger overall, but um, still kind of cool. Um, again, just really intrigued to see what happens with the points on. Um, on, on, on Deathwing units uh, when the uh, field manual comes into effect. Um, what's your vibe, Phil? You, we, we, you know, you, you're obviously doing your uh, uh, Thunder Warriors counts as custodies. 
would you be tempted, Phil, to change it to an inner circle task force and have them count as uh, Deathwing Terminators? Um, probably not more from a sort of WYSIWYG point of view, but I think what's more interesting is maybe running Minotaurs as um, Dark Angels to sort of unlock mm. some of these things. Um, probably not the um, inner circle one just because I don't have Terminators for that army, but um yeah the 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 sort of standard one had some sounds like it had some interesting tricks that would be worth exploring i think indeed well there's one more bag of tricks still to go Ooh. and that is the company of hunters which is masters of maneuver uh adept as a starter unit from your army are eligible to shoot in a turn in which they fell back or advanced um, the restriction is your army can include Dark Angel units, but it cannot include any Adept Society units drawn from other chapters. Keywords, Outrider units from your army gain the Battle Line keyword. Oh, my God. So you can take oh, six finally. units. Wow. It happened, Phil. It happened. I mean, something we speculated ages ago, they finally done, um, but, but not anywhere else. Uh, but, you know, no. maybe we'll see it more uh, in future codexes and stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Six um, units cool. of Outriders, Phil. Go mad. Go mad. Six units of Outriders, each with an ATV. Oh, the possibilities. Oh, dear. Yeah. If you I like mean, ATVs. i tell you what, though. Like, the footprint of that army would be bananas. Like, trying to fit that on the battlefield would be utterly crazy. True. Yeah. And to the best of my knowledge at the moment as well, I think the only Space Marine character still on a bike is the uh, chaplain on bike, isn't it? Uh, Primaris-wise... Or in, in total. I don't think the captain on a bike exists anymore outside of Legends. No, true. Does the Apothecary on bike still exist for... Bl- was it Blood Angels that had it? Dark but Angels have all... a command squad, so they've got a command squad detachment but that's not made up of individual characters that's just right a command okay. squad. Mm. yeah maybe you're right I th- yeah i think in yeah in terms of newer stuff it's just that chaplain on bike yeah it's just the chaplain on bike and then outside of that yeah you've got obviously you've got samuel in uh yeah. codex dark angels so you could add him probably to one of those units but yeah that's interesting so you could take six of them i just don't know if they'd be worth it or not i mean like how many points is Six Outriders with an ATV. Let's go to the app. Uh, but, but not characters. Other data sheets. Because obviously in this particular book, they're not uh, they're not battle line yet. Outriders. Okay, here we go. Outriders. And an ATV. They are 230 points uh, for that. So if you were to take six of them, what would that be? Hundred and oh well that would be uh bear, 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 bear. points essentially. Uh, just part. under well probably what one thousand four hundred, isn't it? Yeah, it's three hundred. Well, because if you think it's yeah two fifty each. One thousand three hundred and eighty, there you go. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. But that so, would literally be that would be wild, because that would be sixty six outriders and six geez. ATVs. The base size on the Outriders is insane. Like, I don't actually understand. I I don't think you could ever put that on a 40k table. Well, I guess you could go into reserves with some of them as well. I'm sure there might be, there's got to be an option to outflank them, right? Quite possibly, Um, quite possibly. So there might be ways around it. Well, we can have a quick read. So you've got uh, Mastercrafted Weapons is an enhancement. Uh, So melee weapons. Oh, sorry, what's their base ability, though? Is it just making them battle line? Uh, no, advance or fall back and char- uh, fall back and um, shoot. Sorry, eligible to shoot if they advance or fall back. Oh right, okay, it was just that. Okay, yeah. Which again, maybe our riders didn't have the assault keyword on them. Maybe that's uh, why that's good. Mm. Hang on, let's just have another look at the outrider data sheet while I'm speculating why this is worth doing. Uh, oh, alphabet. How do you work? Why can I not find Outriders now? Surely it's just... Oh, here we go. It's that's literally that the, the only unit starts with an O. That, um, uh, yeah, so none of their guns have the um, assault. So, yeah, so basically 
you end up with a army of bikes that can advance and shoot, which is probably quite handy. Um, although, again, last little check of the outrider rule. Oh, yeah, so they auto advance six as well. So their movement is 12. So they're basically moving 18 and shooting up the joint. Um, okay. But again, if you're playing them in a competitive 40k setting, you're going to need all of that movement to compensate for all the walls in your way because you can't just <laughs> go through them. So, um, yeah, that would definitely be an interesting build. Um, and again, you'd have to come up with a way of making them look interesting because those mono pose outriders will definitely get very repetitive mm, after true. a couple of squads. Well, you've got the you've got that Dark Angels upgrade sprue. That's what you can use. Oh yes, the Dark Angel upgrade sprue with its one raven wing plumage piece. That's uh, that's what you get. Yep. Yep, it's going to make all the difference. Anyway. Mastercrafter weapons is an enhancement. Uh, Raven wing models only. Melee weapons equipped by the bearer have precision. Yay! Um, again, like literally the the only the only Raven wing model you're going to put this on is a um, a chaplain on bike. So is the chaplain? Does the chaplain need precision? Maybe. Uh, I hope it's a cheap upgrade. Uh, mounted strategist, Ravenwing model only. The Baron unit is eligible to declare a charge and turn in which it advanced or fell back. So this unit can both advance, fall back, shoot, and charge. Ooh. Um, master of maneuvers, Ravenwing model only. If the Baron's unit starts uh, the battle in strategic v- reserves, its points value does not count towards combined points limit for units from your army that are in strategic reserves and for the purpose of setting up that unit on the battlefield, treat the current battle round number as being one higher than it actually is. Okay, cool. Uh, so they can come in on more board edges. Uh, and Recon Hunter, Ravenwing models, uh, it, uh, have Sky- Scout 9 ability. So that's quite mm. good. So some of these enhancements are okay. But again, the only thing you can put them on, unless I'm really being silly here, is the Chaplain on bike. Uh, well, I guess if you were to play Legends, you would get access to more stuff. That is true. That is true. If you were um, to play Legends, you could use more stuff. And, you know, we could assume that over the course of the edition, char- more characters on bikes might appear. That would be nice. But that for would now, be a nice thing right. to see. No. Yeah. And that's the weird thing about it, right? Because, like, that's the weird thing about this particular detachment is is it basically leans into an archetype that is the poorest supported at the moment from GW. Like this and it used to be that like Gravis was really badly supported in terms of characters. Now it's actually okay. Um, Cause they've now got the, gar- uh, the, the, the apothecary and they've got uh, the captain. They don't have a lieutenant yet and they don't have a chaplain and they don't no. have a librarian, but they've at least got something where it's like, yeah, like weirdly, Basically, the absence of a captain or a lieutenant on bike is a weird um, is a weird um, thing, um, and definitely hinders um, the overall viability of taking this particular detachment. But again, as Phil has said, and I believe uh, it to be likely that we will see some other characters on bikes real soon. I hope so because the chaplain on bike. I know you are not a big bike person, Phil, which is weird because you were successor white scars for ages. But my point <laughs> is, is that. It's such it's such an oddity. It's so it's such a hipster. Um, I know, but you know that when they do, I mean, they're going to do White Scar specific book. I guess not because they're all in the Space book. But if they I ever wanted unlikely. to be doing more White Scar stuff, that might be when you'll see the bike characters come along. I speculate that the 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 bike marines is to be the eleventh edition burst as it were yeah, bike maybe. marines will be where, where we go in 11th but um but yeah so yeah stratagems uh what stratagems do they have well first and foremost phil no shocker there's armor of contempt Ooh, Ooh. i don't think there's any space marine detachment that doesn't have armor of contempt uh well i think we talked about it in the space marine one and i thought it wasn't in a few but then it was actually just the position of it had changed because it was in alphabetical order and there was something else with an a in front so yeah they're in all the space marine ones that's fair that's fair but in addition 
to Armour of Content. You've also got Hunter's Trail, uh, which happens in the command phase. Uh, one Raven Wing mounted unit uh, from your army that is within range and objective marker you control. So it's an important distinction. So this doesn't work on Raven Wing aircraft, nor does it work on Storm Speeders, um, which are themselves Raven Wing as well. So only bicycles uh, benefit from this. Uh, that objective marker remains under your control, even if you have no models within range of it, until your opponent controls it at the start or end of any turn. Now, again, they've clarified this in the rec recent FAQ Arata rules commentary. That's no longer the case, as long as you basically touch it uh, just the once uh, you take it off of them. But nonetheless, uh, it's... Uh, uh, yeah, at the end of any phase rather than any turn now, isn't it? Correct, yeah. So previously, yeah. you had to have it at the start or end of any turn. Now, it's at the end, start or end of any phase. Um, but other than that, it's basically sticky objectives, which, given that you're an incredibly mobile fighting force, is pretty decent, I would say. Yeah, because you, you basically want to do it on your home of objectives and whiz off. Yeah, yeah. Basically. Uh, next, we have Talon Strike. Uh, this is a str strategic ploy stratagem. Uh, the Hunter's Trail was a strategic ploy stratagem as well, if anyone cares to pay attention. Uh, it happens in the shooting or fight phase. One Ravenwing mounted, so bicycle unit uh, from your army that has not been selected to shoot or fight this phase. Until the end of the phase, each time a model in your unit makes uh, an attack that targets an infantry character or mounted character, Unit add one to the wound roll. Interesting. So basically, add one to the wound roll when targeting an infantry character or a mounted character. So not a monster character or a vehicle character, um, which I guess makes sense. Although it would have been nice maybe to have gotten the extra to wound against things like Imperial Knights, but I guess mm. they're not going to give you that. But um, yeah, basically. Either when you're either fighting or shooting, you get plus one to wound. Not bad for one CB. Yeah, seems all right. Yeah. Uh, Death on the wind. This is a battle tactic stratagem. Uh, in fact, it's worth mentioning that all three of the remaining stratagems are battle tactic stratagems. So there are four battle tactic stratagems here, um, which makes it all the more frustrating uh, that you don't get access to captains. Oh. Yes, because there's no way to use the freebie from the captain yeah. on the the bikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that is true. Yeah. yeah. So how nice of them to give uh, the Ravenwing players all these different ways that they could have uh, done uh, this for free, yet not benefit from it in any way, shape. Oh, or form. Well, they might. You don't know. It might happen one day. It might happen one day. It might. Anyway, happens in the shooting phase. One Ravenwing unit from your army that has uh, just shot. Select one enemy unit that was hit by one or more of those attacks, uh, that unit must take a battle shock test when doing so if one or more Ravenwing unit from your army is within six of that enemy unit, subtract one from the test. There you go. Battle shock. Ooh. Uh, See, so you want this to go up against the generic yes. um, Dark Angels detachment so you both get your benefits. That's it. You want to be shooting at yourself somehow. Um yeah. <laughs> High-speed focus, uh, your opponent's shooting phase just after enemy unit has been selected uh, as a target, or selected its target, sorry. Uh, one braving unit from your army that was selected as the target of one or more of the attacking unit's attacks. To the end of the phase, each time attacks target your unit, subtract one from the hit roll. Uh, it's all right. Um, yeah, Re reduce it. Minus one to hit is fine, I suppose. Um it is the most underwhelming of um, debuffs because it doesn't stack with anything. Um, if it reduced their ballistic skill by one, that would have been really powerful. But um, oh, well, that's, that's almost too broken if you basically could end up in a way where they could potentially be at minus two. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it does happen so, in so other instances. You yeah, normally for pluses though, right? Rather than minuses. No, minuses as well. There are I, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it is, but there is definitely something that out there that does it. Okay. And and then do you when do you apply it when you're being shot at? Yeah, when you're being shot at. So your opponent's shooting phase yeah. just after enemy unit has selected its targets. So okay. you yeah, because sometimes it's like uh 
you, you've got to select something at the start of the shooting phase and you don't know if you're even going to be shot at. So, yeah, seems seems useful. I think, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, we have rapid reappraisal, uh, end of your opponent's fight phase. So end of your opponent's fight phase, one Ravenwing unit from your army that is not within engagement range of uh, one or more enemy units. Uh, basically remove it and place it in strategic reserves um that's really powerful for two reasons uh one it's a redeploy uh which is massively helpful but also being placed in strategic reserves is useful because you don't have to come back straight away you can come back whenever you like so a lot of abilities that do this is go back uh come off the board come back the next turn this is specifically strategic reserves so you can stay off the board for a while uh i'd need to sense check whether strategic reserve wording has changed to the extent that you need to be on the board by the end of battle round three. Um, uh, only if you haven't uh, been on the table already. Fine. I think you can normally go back in strategic reserve from like turns three and four and you're fine. Amazing. So yeah, basically, I'm pretty sure on that. Yeah, one CP, pop back into strategic reserves. Happy days. It's a very powerful yes. ability. Um, definitely gives you a lot of flex. I mean, again, I don't know. And what can you apply that to? Uh, you can apply it to any Ravenwing unit, uh, which is key. Oh, so again, uh, find yourself a Ravenwing thing with the smallest footprint uh, and maybe <sighs> hide it around somewhere. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know. It's stuff like, because again, like one of the things that's always worth highlighting is, is that uh, Ravenwing units do include uh, the Ravenwing Flyers. Um, again, I'm not going to suggest that they are top tier incredible, um, but they do have, right, let's look at the Dark Talon, for example. Uh, so the Dark Talon, uh, oh, is a hover. So that's really valuable. So because it's a hover, means it can start on the board. It's got Hurricane Bolters. Um, so Rapid Fire 6. Uh, twin linked, so that's six attacks, or rather 12 attacks within 12 inch range. Uh, and then you've got the uh, Rift Cannon, um, which is wow, actually, good lord, D3 plus one shots, uh, with the blast, uh, keyword as well as devastating wounds, uh, ballistical three plus strength 16 minus four free damage. Goodness gracious, that's all right. Um, and it's got a stasis bomb once per turn. One model from your army with this ability can use it at the end of a normal move. If it does, you can select one enemy unit, excluding the aircraft that model moved over this phase. That unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Da, 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 da. So, yeah, I mean, something like that would be fun, wouldn't it? Just mm. chuck that back in uh, reserves. Like, um, yeah, you could definitely do some interesting stuff with the Dark Talon. Similarly, the Nephilim, uh, that's also got hover. Um, so again, could be an option, maybe. Um, I, I, I genuinely think these two flyers aren't terrible, given that they have hover. Uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at Storm Ravens because I think they're really, really strong. Uh, have done for a while, but I've also been looking at things like the Storm Talon. I feel like that's pretty decent. Um, but yeah, the Nephilim's coming in at one hundred eighty-five, and the um, uh, the Dark Talon is going to run you 200 points. But yeah, for like 185, it's a pretty durable hull. Um, I mean, admittedly only T8, but yeah, good mobility. Could be an option. Could be something quite funny. So yeah. Yeah. Maybe I not. mean, I like the Nephilim. I think it looks, it's probably their best looking flyer. Yeah. I, 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 range. Um, I'd concur with that. It's sort of a weird one. It's sort of somewhere between like, a Forge World kind of guard style flyer and, yes. the, and the yeah, Storm yeah. Talon, weirdly. Like it's got like the arse of the Storm Talon with the wingspan of something cooler. Yes, like uh not the Avenger, but yeah, like the lightning or something, or yeah, it, it's got that kind of vibe. It, yeah. It's a good amalgamation of the two. I can't kind of wish it was just a kit that was available for more. Space Marine factions, basically. Yeah, I, I, or, I, 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 I would disagree. just run it as a Storm Talent or something because yeah, Storm Talent's not great. Um, so, yeah, the Mega Bolter on it's pretty cool as well. So it's good at killing infantry. Yeah, and the last cannons aren't terrible. I the guess. last cannons are fine. I think you know the fact is is 
Yeah, I'd probably go with the Twin Heavy Bolters and the Avenger Mega Bolter, really lean into mm. the two damage anti infantry strength five variant of it. Um, and you still get the, uh, you've got the Black Sword missiles, which are anti flyer, uh, or sorry, anti fly two plus. Um, so again, two attacks with that, plus three, strength eight, minus two D6 damage. So yeah, I mean, look, all, all things being equal, uh, also as well, worth highlighting, five plus invulnerable save. On the um, on the Nephilim and the Dark Talon, which is oh god, yeah. Plus, uh, assuming because I'm reading the old one, it's got lightning fast maneuvers, which is minus one to be hit, and if the thing shooting at is fly, minus one to wound as well. Yeah, so pretty. That's really durable as a something that will just be a nuisance to get rid of, and therefore not easy to to kill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, and and you take it as hover. And it still gets it minus one hit because, again, people overlook this with flyers. People think, oh, if they're aircraft, they are still minus one to hit. They're not. Uh, that rule doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, just, yeah. yeah, it's really weird. But, Got rid of it. <laughs> yeah. But this as a hover seems pretty strong, man. Like, I'm, I'm okay with it. I think, mean, like, yeah. I mean, again, the land speed of Vengeance. I guess, am, am I right in thinking it only has hover? So it isn't a. doesn't have like the. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. Is supersonic aircraft still a rule, or was that gone? I will turn to the page because it, it used to be you had that as a rule, uh, yeah. and then actually, if I look at the Avenger fighter, because I'm pretty sure that's uh, that's hover still the same. as well. And then hover was an option, but it might be that's just baked into. Oh no! So oh, interesting. So Avenger Strike Fighter doesn't have hover, so it is. It must just be baked into the. I want to say fly a keyword. Yeah, so it's or an aircraft. aircraft yeah, it's an aircraft variable. So I'm looking at the Storm Raven here, or the Stormhawk Interceptor, and they've just got like aircraft. So yeah, I think that's the the, the difference. Ah, really. uh, yeah, it's in the aircraft rule, and then um, yes, and then hover is a like an adaption to that rule. Okay, I'm actually going to just take a quick little look at. <laughs> Where's the downloads uh, on... Oh, here we are. Downloads. Warhammer 40,000 uh, field manual. Let's have just a quick little look. Uh, so, Dark Angels. The Nephilim in today's money. Oh, okay. So, the Nephilim, according to the uh, manual... Is 195 points in the in the codex supplement. It's 185 points. So again, mm. I still think it's worth it. Could be cheaper. Yeah. Um, what's the dark? Uh, b- b- dark, not dark shroud. Dark talent. Oh, okay. So the dark talent in the supplement is 200 points. Here it's 210 points. So se- seemingly, Games Workshop feel like these things are more valuable currently than they are being reflected well, in this book but we'll see yeah. we'll see what I mean, they now it's got a good gun on it so yeah not too surprised i mean yeah i like it though man i think like yeah i think the raven wing detachment is kind of cool i think the thing is with it is though is that like if you're doing it i feel like you're doing it very specifically to do a fun themed army and i think that's great i just think the thing that really lets it down is its complete absence of characters. Um, again, one of the things that is actually really annoying, um, and we can get into the data sheets next, I suppose, but one of the things that is really annoying now is the reduction of, um, you know, uh, characters in, uh, you know, in terms of what you can kind of mix up. So previously yeah. you could have had like a librarian on a bike or a chat. Well, you still have a chaplain on a bike, but you can have like a, captain on a bike or maybe well i don't think you've ever been able to do the lieutenant on bike but there was definitely options for more stuff on bikes um whereas now literally you've got samael and you've got and you've got a chaplain um which yeah it, it just doesn't feel like it just doesn't feel like you've got enough to work with yeah no that's fair enough yeah. Um I was gonna say, did we finish all the stratagems? Was that the last one? No, there is uh, there is one, one more. You're very very good to remind me. Uh oh no, 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 we did them all. We did them all. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So overall, I'd say 
I'd say Death Wing or rather Inner Circle Task Force is okay. I think it's got some interesting stuff in it, but I probably lean more into the first company from uh, the Space Marine book if I was looking to go Terminator Heavy. Plus, the cool thing about that one is is that it actually gives you more options to lean into things like Blade Guard, Vanguard, Stern Guard. Um, admittedly, actually, I say all this stuff out loud. All of that stuff gets the Death Wing keyword, so I'm talking nonsense. You yes, could- I was going to say, don't they? Also, is it Inner Circle still a keyword? Because it used to be those gain the Inner Circle keyword. No, it doesn't layer in that sense anymore now. It's just Death Wing. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, it's just Death Wing. So Death Wing is basically your first company veteran keyword now. Um, and by all accounts, I assume the Inner Circle companions have it. Yes, they do. The Inner Circle companions are Death Wing as well. So you mm. can also take the Inner Circle Companions. You can't take the Command Squad, but you can take the Inner Circle Companions. In um... I, I assume Lionel, is he also Deathwing? Lionel is not a member of the Deathwing, interestingly. Oh. I know, it's weird, isn't it? So Lionel is not a member of the Deathwing, but like every other character is. So Because uh... he's sort of outside of the normal rank, maybe. I mean, <laughs> I'm surprised <laughs> he's not class as well. Actually, just looking at it here, just to be, uh, oh no, that's leader. Uh, yes, yeah, so he's deaf wing. Yeah, pretty much everything else is a deaf wing except Lionel Johnson. You know what? That feels like something that needs to get rotted. I feel like that's a mistake. I feel like they'll probably come around and go, oh, wait, whoops, here you go. Uh, but maybe it's not a mistake because giving him access to some stratagems that Deathwing could have used might have been a bit too overpowered. Yes, yeah, no, that would make sense. But at the same time, but that, yeah, because Bobby G doesn't really benefit from any sort of stratagem specifically because he's not like Terminator or whatever. So maybe that's why they've kept it off Lionel Johnson. Who knows what um, the logic was there, but it does make sense that he doesn't have it in terms of game design, but in terms of obviously the fluff, it makes zero sense. Yeah. But mm. Anyway, God bless him. You know, again, though, you'd think he'd have all the keywords though, right? He'd be like Death Wing, Raven Wing, Iron Wing, Dread Wing, et cetera, et cetera. You know, throw it all in the mix. Give them everything, yeah. Give them all the things. The cross keys and circles within circles and all that stuff. Um, So, yeah, data sheet-wise, we can pretty much wrap up thoughts and sentiment towards this thing by just talking data sheets. Um, A lot of the stuff, like the cool stuff, like Lionel Johnson has been slightly debuffed from where he was before. Uh, The main culprit of this is his uh, sweep attack so previously his sweep attack was exactly the same as it is now but it did two damage so 16 attacks hitting on two strength six minus three ap but it did two damage now it's all that that does what (laughs) fair enough yeah but other than that he's mostly the same he's still got his three plus environmental save which is crazy good he's still got his two up Mm -hmm. armor save which in combination with three up in one save is crazy good he's still got (laughs) Um, his uh, Primark of the First Legion shenanigans, which I will tell you now is silly good on occasion. So I always go with all secrets uh, will be revealed, which is once per turn uh, when your opponent uh, targets a unit in their army uh, with a stratagem, uh, but before the stratagem effects are resolved, if that unit is within 12 of this model, I line out Johnson, you gain one CP and that enemy must take a battle shock test. If that test is failed, in addition to the unit being battle shocked, that stratagem's effect are not resolved. Ooh. So they lose uh, that stratagem still counts as having been uh, used this phase. So it, you you lose the CP, you uh, and and just for doing it, I gain a CP. So you do something within twelve of him, I gain a CP, and then. Uh, you roll a battle shot test, and then basically, yeah, um, it's super good because I was running the lion a few weekends past at an event, and you would be amazed the amount of times that people want to do stratagems near the lion, and you'd be amazed the amount of times they fail battle shot tests when under duress. 
um, is quite hilarious. Yeah. Admittedly, it's only once per um, per turn, but that's obviously your turn and your opponent's turn. So pretty strong still um, because obviously you can do it in your turn. So if you're you know doing something and they want to do something defensive or interrupt combat, you can obviously be like, no, 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 give me a CP and also see if you could do it, uh, which is crazy nice. good. I, I loved it because I played against an Eldari player before Phantasm had been nerfed. And Lionel Johnson ran up to a big unit of Wraith Guard and the Wraith Guard were like, ah, we're going to Phantasm away. And I'm like, nope, not today. <laughs> so that was hilarious. Um, and then, yeah, so that one's really strong. He's also got um, like an aura of the Watcher in the Dark thing. So no hiding from the Watchers. Not that good anymore for the reasons why. But again, if they FAQ it to incorporate uh, wounds caused from devastating, it'd be pretty good. Um, and then there's Martial Exemplar, which is well friendly Adeptus units. We're in sixth model each time. Uh, model in that unit makes a melee attack and one to the hit roll. Circumstantially okay, but I'm almost always all secrets revealed. That's that's where I'm staying uh, with the lion. Um so, yeah, so Lionel Johnson got slightly nerfed because uh, he lost a bit of damage, but otherwise I still think he's an absolute tank and a terrifying beast of a thing. Um, the fact that he's got eight attacks uh, at strength 12 minus four flat four damage, is it, it's, it's pretty hilarious, right? How many wounds has he got? Uh, he's on 10 wounds, I think. Hang on, I just turned the page. Yeah, 10 wounds, tough as nine. Oh, wow. yeah. But he is a monster, Phil. He is a monster. So can't just... No walking through walls. No walking through walls for him. But he also does get a uh, loan op when he's within free of a friendly... Uh, oh, that's you know. cool. Yeah, so he's all right, yeah. man. I, I like Lionel Johnson. I like both the Primarchs, Roberte and uh, Lionel. I think Lionel is a more blunt instrument. I think Roberte is a more um, a more utilitarian option. I feel. Yeah. I feel like, for yeah. me... On balance, I think Gilliman is better, um, but I do like the line. But the line has. I think one. the line still got is Forest Walk. Yes, he does still also have the ability to teleport in. And um, uh, yeah, so. Uh, buh, 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 hang on. He's got Deep Strike. He's just got Deep Strike. They don't call it Forest Walking anymore. Oh, true. Yeah. Because I think it. Could he redeploy before? I'm trying to remember now. Now you're was asking. it just effectively a deep strike? Hold on. Let me take I'm thinking that. we're thinking of his rules in... We're thinking ninth edition rules for him. Because in ninth edition, when they introduced him, he had that special rule, which was back when we didn't have the word deep strike for deep strike. It was called forest walk. And the difference with him yes. was is he would arrive from what we now call deep strike or what we've always called deep strike. And he used to get re-roll charges or like plus one to the charge or something. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I couldn't remember if he also had an ability to like effectively teleport around the board using Probably. that or if it was just possibly, I can't remember. But now. it's gone now, yeah. Phil. Like uh, you, you, it, has, it has. You're yeah. talking about rules that are like seven months ago. I've already forgotten it all. I know, it's funny that that was technically an edition ago. Yeah, yeah, well, not even that. Less than a year ago, the Lion had these rules, but no longer. <laughs> um, so, yeah, look, uh, there, are two key fi- there are two key pieces within this codex that makes it super good, right? The first of them is Asriel. Asriel is stupid good. Like, uh, to be honest with you, most people who play Space Marines are looking at Asriel going, yeah, I could put him in a unit because there's no downside to Asriel. It's like, have you got a 10-man unit of something powered armoured? Asriel could probably lead it. And if he can lead it, why wouldn't he be, right? That's sort of the deal with Asriel. And the other one is the Dark Shroud because obviously the Dark Shroud's been terrible for ages. So inevitably, it's really good now. (laughs) Right, because of okay. course, um, I'll do the dark shroud first. Um, basically, it is a ten wound land speeder, um, specifically called the dark shroud, uh, and uh, yeah, it's got the icon of old Caliban, 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 
which is an aura. Uh, while friendly, Adeptus Astartes units, so all Adeptus Astartes units, are in six of this model. Bear in mind, it's got quite a big footprint. Uh, models in that unit have the stealth ability, and each time a ranged attack targets that unit, that unit has the benefit of cover, right? That is mm. pretty huge in combination, because what that essentially means is, is that you are giving your army an aura that is essentially the benefit of uh, the stealthy battalion thingy so if you basically were basically that's the same thing that raven guard get or raven guard type detachments get but you're getting it as an aura so you can kind of layer it on top of some other stuff so what's been very popular that i've observed is people are taking the may as well be iron hands detachment the iron storm detachment which is basically like the stupid devastating vehicle variant and they're taking Mm. the vehicle variant that's like super powerful gives them all like you know, really, really good offensive options. And then they're layering in the Dark Shroud to give them the increased durability um, because they're getting mm-hmm. the cover and they're getting the minus to hit from stealth, basically. Nice. Yeah. So it's a very, very potent piece. And then if we talk about Azrael quickly, Azrael is like, he is the captain's captain. Like, Marnius Kalgar is really good. He gives you an extra CP. He's got two bodyguards that you can do all sorts of weird wound shenanigans with if you want to be that kind of player. Um, he also gives you the ability to advance and charge, which is massive because you basically put him in units like aggressors or units like blade guard, and they've got crazy utility. Um, but really, it's that extra CP that makes Kalgar super duper good, right? Like Kalgar is a boss. Azrael is just kind of, again, in the same way as what I was saying before about how Kalgar is sort of better than the Lion, the same is sort of true in reverse with the Chapter Masters. Azrael is so much more utility. So basically his main gimmick is is uh, that he's the Supreme Grandmaster. So while leading uh, a unit, weapons equipped by models in that unit have sustained hits one, which is like massive because sustained hits one, especially if you're a unit of hell blasters or a unit of stern guard, you're blasting out a lot of shots, right? Um, so to be able to get sustained hit one on those is massive. So your big 10 man unit or something shooting, you're going to benefit from that. Um, at the start of your command phase, if this model is on the battlefield, you gain one CP. So sorry, he's also got Calgar's CP ability, mm. which is huge because you're gaining an extra CP which is massive, gives you so much more utility. And then lastly, you've got the Lion's Helm, which basically gives every model in the unit a four-up invulnerable save. Oh, wow. Yeah. And once per battle in any phase, the bear can summon the Watcher in the Dark. When it does so, you get four-up four feel no pain against mortal wounds. So you can basically add that Watcher in the Dark bonus to anything, but really the, the main gimmick is that you're getting a four-up invun. So again... Big 10 man unit of, say, Stern Guard, led by Azrael, is getting uh, a lot of benefits uh, ticking over on it. Plus, you can still add a lieutenant to those squads as well. So you can give yourself the lethal hit bonus. And again, I would actually say that if you're taking Azrael, you may as well pay the lieutenant tax because the le- lieutenant allows you to fall back and then charge, I think. Uh, or it might be fall back and shoot. Whatever it does, but it gives you the lethal hits, which is the mm. the main thing. And just so happens that Azrael is armed with a uh, anti-infantry 4 plus devastating wounds, rapid fire 1, uh, 2 attack, strength 8, minus 3, 2 damage gun. Um, so he's pretty. He's no slouch himself for adding to the output of the shooting. Um, and should someone want to throw down with you, you've got weapon skill two plus strength six minus four AP two damage, devastating wound sword. He is just all shades of awesome. Um, and again, in terms of the points that it'll cost you today, given the fact that he's basically the same rules uh, today as he as he was previously. You're basically looking at 105 points for Azrael, and he's worth every one of them. Like, I, I genuinely think that this probably is the best Space Marine character, hands down. I think Marnius Kalgar Ooh. is up there, 
I think Malnius Calgar and Azriel are your number one, number two. And you could debate which one you'd put above the other. I would probably put Azriel at the top of the pile, just because you could immediately understand what utility he brings to the table. But then the same is true of Calgar. It's just different flavors of the same sort of thing. But I just think, yeah, Azriel's scary good, man. Like, just give four up in buns to a whole unit or something is wild, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, that sounds um, good. What would you add him to, Phil? You can add him to an Assault Intercessor squad, a Blade Guard Veteran squad, Hell Blaster squad, Inferno squad, Inner Circle Companions, Intercessor squad, Stern Guard Veteran, or, wait for it, a Tactical squad. Hmm. Uh, I think Hell Blasters would be a fun one to do. I think that's pretty um, much the default. Bl- Blade Guards seem a bit pointless because they've already got an Invan. Um, I yeah, the inner circle, uh, no, sort of co- companions. I mean, I don't know how good they are, so maybe them as well. Well, we'll talk, we'll talk about those, needed. those next, I suppose. But yeah, personally, I think Sterngar veterans are the way to go. They've had a reasonable oh, yeah. points reduction 180 points for a unit of 10 with sustained hits one. It's pretty good. Um, all things being equal, got all the dev wounds in there, etc. So yeah, I'd probably lean into that. Although if I was doing the Stern Guard, I would partner him with a Ancient rather than a Lieutenant. Um, okay. Yeah, I'd give him the Ancient rather than a Lieutenant. Because the Ancient, forgive me, I forget the different Lieutenant, uh, sorry, the different Ancients have different abilities, but I believe the Ancient uh, gives you the uh, shoot back on four plus ability. Yes. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. Because the Terminator Ancient gives you plus one to hit if you're targeting something that's wounded. And if it's below half strength, you get plus one to wound as well. Um, but I think the regular ancient is plus one OC and shoot back, which is fine. Cause the, the only reason I take them over hell blasters is because hell blasters kind of want to die. So you don't really want the four of him. Right. Okay. Yeah. I see what you mean. Plus, I guess if they've got the Ancient, they've already got the... Because don't help us have a shoot-back ability anyway, so they don't need the Ancient for that. Correct, yeah. So they want to die to shoot back because they've got the native ability. And obviously, Mm. the way they die is they shoot all their hazardous weapons and roll hazardous tests and then die. Um, Yeah. Whereas with with the Stern Guard, they go in, they do Devastating Wounds, they're cheaper, and they want that durability. I think it suits them better to to be with Stone Guard. It feels like Azrael and Stone Guard are the the way forward. But um, yeah, just super good, man. Like crazy good, even. Um, mm, interesting. Do so while we're on the topic of plasma. Mm. Obviously, that is Dark Angel's speciality. Um, so, isn't there a bonus for that in like the generic detachment or anything, or like an army wide rule? There was a specific uh, strat called Weapons of the Dark Age, but I forget what that buff did off the top of my head. Let me just double check it. Uh, Unforgiven Task Force, Unbreakable Lines. Oh, here it is. Uh, Oh, no, Weapons of the First Legion was an enhancement. Uh, Add one to the attacks and strength and damage character of melee weapons. Yeah, no. Uh, Definitely Assault. No, I'm talking rubbish. Death on the Wind. Let me check one last little place. Uh, fire discipline. No, yeah, no. That's that. All that. All that old. Uh, our plasma is better than your plasma. Is uh, gone away, mate. No, oh, that's a shame. They, they just change. don't. They just don't. They don't. They don't hit the same anymore. Uh, hmm. But you can take plasma cannons in uh, Deathwing squads. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's where they get you. But um. The only other really like new detachment or unit within the army is the Inner Circle Companions. Uh, obviously, there's like a refresh of Deathwing Knights, but we kind of already talked about those earlier. So let's just talk about an Inner Circle Companion. So uh, it's got a movement of six, which is very Space Marine, a toughness of four, which is very Space Marine, uh, save a three plus. You know where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, they got three wounds each, which is one better than your regular Space Marine. Mm. Uh, leadership is six plus uh, an OC2. So, yeah, it's all right. Uh, they have a heavy bolt pistol, uh, which is range 18, strength four, minus one, one damage. Uh, 
And then melee weapons, they've got caliber, uh, caliber knight great swords uh, that can either strike or sweep. When they strike, their weapon skill three plus. They've got four attacks, strength six, minus one, two damage. And then intriguingly, oh, by the way, they're also lethal hits when they strike. Uh, the mm-hmm. sweep profile is sustained hits two, mm-hmm. weapon skill three plus, four attacks still. Strength six minus one, one damage. Um, so less damage, but the possibility of creating a, a, a good chunk of extra attacks. I mean, if you've basically got three of these guys, you swing in 12 times. If you threw in re-rolls because of oaths a moment, because let's try and weigh it in their favor, you could math it out to get between three and four sixes. Let's say you get four sixes for argument's sake. That's an extra um, eight attacks. Ooh. So, you know, you could get a bunch of hits, but minus one's pretty mid, uh, and one damage is certainly underwhelming. So, well, yeah, but that's like, oh, I'm up against cultists. Like, that's what it's for. Yeah. People that don't really have saves to begin with. Yeah, but you know what? I would have liked to have just seen the attacks increase. Like, if it had just been, rather than give them sustains hit two, take that away and give them six attacks each, you know? Yes. Normally, that's how sort of sweep works. Yeah. So. Interesting, yeah. You're feeling lucky, yeah, basically. Absolutely. Uh, their abilities include the Oaths of Moment, uh, the Brazers of Judgment. While a character model is leading this unit, each time attack targets this unit, subtract one from the hit rolls. Okay. Animity uh, 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 for the unworthy. Um, okay. Uh, each time a model in this unit makes an attack that targets a character unit, add one to the hit roll. It's all right, I guess. So they're going to be hitting on twos against characters. You can take six of them, um, and they're all just armed with the same weapons. So there's no banner. The, one of these models very clearly has a banner, Phil. No. But but there's no rules for Is it an ability? There's no rules for the banner whatsoever. Mm. And there's no separate entry for a guy with a banner. And the amusing thing is, is in the photography underneath Inner Circle Companions and Lionel Johnson, there's a five-man unit of um, Inner Circle Companions, which implies that the banner was actually supposed to be like a separate ancient miniature uh, at one point. And, but they've just gone, nah, 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 it's just a three to six-man unit. It's like, okay. But I guess... Oh, so it's a... Uh... Is it by default? Does it just come as it's either three or six? Either three or six. But as photographed, oh. there's a five man unit of them. Uh, well, here's the thing I think the general idea is people photography, the people photographing, people photographing the minis often don't know what the rules are going to be. Yes. So they probably by default would assume, oh, yes, yeah, a five man squad because that's how space minis normally come. Yeah. Um, and was like, oh, and there's this extra ancient model. Uh, so I guess potentially just left it out. So that could be more of a mistake on the photographer's part rather than, um, I don't know, something more nefarious uh, that was happening um, in the creation of this unit. Um, yeah, odd that it's got no rules, though. That is strange. It's super strange. I mean, obviously, if you're looking to add an ancient to your army, I mean, at the end of the day, there's no reason why you can't, instead of running in a circle, companions... Uh, you can still, as a uh, Dark Angels player, still take the uh, companions, the, the command squad, which does have an ancient mm. in it. So you could just rep it as that. Um, but obviously, if you're really leaning into this Deathwing stuff, you're going to want these guys. I mean, for me, the unit is like super underwhelming. Um, with, with the rules that they have, they need a serious points reduction because at the moment they're saying that a inner circle companion squad of uh, six models will set you back 210 points, 105 points for free. Uh, that is a lot of points for a free wound power armored space marine with just a bolt pistol and a melee weapon. Um, and not an imp- incredibly impressive melee weapon at that. Well, yeah. So, how many points was that? 105. Okay, so, um, yeah, fair enough. I was going to say, uh, uh, Blade Guard Veteran Squad for five is 180. Oh, that'd be six, so, wouldn't it? Because they're 90 points for free, aren't they, the Blade Oh, Guards? yes, it's, sorry. It's um, I was excluding the Sergeant who's mentioned separately. Yeah, so it's 
Yes, and it's six. Basically. And they've got an Invan. And yes, they have an Invan. I was going to say, so the, the, these guys don't get Invans at all. No, no, no Invans no. for these guys. Unless, of course, you put Asriel in the squad and then they've all got four up Invan. Well, yes, that's true. Yeah. And th- there was four attacks, didn't you say? Four attacks, yeah. What was the sat line again? Uh, so in its strike form, it's weapon skill three, strength six, minus one, two damage. Oh, yeah. So Master Crafted Power Weapon hits on threes, strength five, so slightly worse, but minus two, two damage. Yeah, yeah which is what you want. But obviously, right? you've got no extra, you know, swing ability to do extra attacks or anything like that. And they also have heavy uh, bolt pistols. Uh, but I Guess you. Oh, they. You know, sergeant can also take the near vike or, or the. Um, what's the uh, What's the well. unit ability of blade guard veterans at the minute? Uh, uh, so at the start of a fight phase, you can select one of the following. Uh, so you can have um, reroll hit rolls of one or reroll saving rate throws of one. Okay, I feel like f- for fifteen points less, they feel a little better. How many wounds is a blade guard? Um, three. Okay, so same. Yeah, OC at the moment. One, no. Okay, well these guys are OC two, but yeah. I don't know. I'd rather have a four up invan over OC two. Yes, <laughs> I think I would as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they're all shades of meh. Um. Uh, yeah, I, that's what you get for secretly being the fallen, I guess. If well, that's, that's it. the uh, tinfoil hat conspiracy of yours, Dan. When did they? they when did they become Primaris Marines as well? Though that's the thing I still can't get my head. Well, around. then they're maybe not the fallen. That's the thing you don't know. Oh, maybe, maybe they could just be something else that's new. The lion took them off to the forest and gave them a little tickle, and they came out bigger. Don't read too much into that. That was obviously not how I was intending it. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe if they were the fallen, maybe he was like, "Well, you can, you know, something." There's no reason why they're not fallen that have become Primaris because they're now loyal. I just thought as well, my analogy really brings new reason to the naming the you know new me- metaphors to the naming oh, the convention risen. of the risen. Yes. Um, yes. But that's anyway, <laughs> I'm talking about baking, everyone. Baking. That's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, look, I mean, there's other stuff in there, but, you know, you can definitely find other people on the internet that do a more comprehensive review than we do. Uh, I mean, saying that, I think we've talked for nearly two hours on the topic, so uh, we must have said something useful by now. Otherwise, you know, God. Uh, yeah, Dark Angels, I like them. I think, you know, it, the, the, there's some really strong components. You can definitely cherry pick stuff. There's still some interesting things, but I do feel like, more often than not, when you see Dark Angel armies in a competitive sense, you're going to basically be seeing good Space Marine stuff made better by a few choice Dark Angel components, which essentially is what you were already seeing anyway. So, yeah, I, I think it's cool. I think it shows a really interesting future for what we're going to see for Space Marines. I'm really intrigued to see what more meaningful updates could look like. Because the thing is with the Dark Angel releases is sure we got new characters. We got the new Asmodai, we got the new um the new Belial, which are all really nice. But a lot of the stuff is still the old stuff, right? We still got the Black Knights, we still got the Flyers, we still got the weird free man land speeder teams. So there's a lot of stuff in there that's kind of the same. They haven't gone for like a massive range refresh on it. They've just added in Basically, they've changed Terminators, added new Deathwing Night Sculpts, given us one new unit, and then refreshed a couple of characters. Mm. What I'm really interested in is what is going to happen with something like, say, Space Wolves or Blood Angels, where there's much more potential for a much more meaningful range refresh. Um, who knows if we'll see it, but I think I've said many times, Blood Angels feel like they're probably going to get a new Sangard kit, and then most of the other stuff is probably going to become upgrades, which... I don't particularly mind, but lots of people on the uh, YouTube comments section tell me off for being too negative about Def Company, so I won't, uh, you know, throw that out there again. But I think Space Wolves have the potential to be a really meaningful update, and I think if Space Wolves are a more meaningful update, that could be really exciting. Although there could be a Wave 2 of Black Templars as well. Who knows? But, uh, yeah, Wave 2 Black Templars would be super cool. I don't know what they do with them, but then... do they need anything? I thought they were done. I thought they've had of it. Unless they do new stuff, of course. Yeah, that's what my head's at with it, right? Like, give them a new unit. So, they could either give you brand new units or 
um, potentially you could get upgrade throughs for Terminators, something like that. Um, you, you really lean into customizing existing units. Yeah, yeah. that could be good. Yeah. I was going to say about um, Dark Angels. Have they? What did they lose in terms of what went to what went to Legends? And actually, thank you for bringing that up because that was the point that I actually wanted to make. I genuinely think the 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 losses didn't hit too hard, and a lot of people talk about the Talon Master going. So the Talon Master unfortunately had to go because the Talon Master was based off of the old um, land speeder kit that has been discontinued. I was hopeful that they might have given us an upgrade for uh, the Storm Speeders, so as we would have got like a new Talon Master, or that they would have given us a new uh, bike character. Um, I think the Dark Angels would have been a perfectly reasonable opportunity for them to do a captain on bike, um, but they haven't done it. So is what it is. Um, but yeah, lost the Talon Master. The loss of the Talon Master is a blow to a lot of people because a lot of people have used it for a long time and have definitely enjoyed using it. Um, personally, to me, uh, the uh, the loss that I feel hits hardest is the Deathwing Strike Master. So the Deathwing Strike Master is a Terminator Lieutenant in the same vein as how the Talon Master is a Ravenwing Lieutenant. Um, I think being able to have the Strike Master was really valuable. I was sprinkling those into lots of units of Terminators. I think they added a lot of uh, utility. Terminators with lethal hits are actually quite scary because they pump out a lot of shots. Um, so, yeah, losing the Strike Master to me is probably more of a blow than the uh, Talon Master was. But, um, yeah, over, overall, they haven't really suffered very many losses whatsoever, really. They've just basically lost the uh, Strike Master, the Talon Master. Oh, and the um, Deathwing Command Squad has gone as well. So the Deathwing Command Squad is now discontinued. So no one was really using it, but you, you don't have it as an option anymore. So you can't have an Apothecary and a Champion of Caliban and a ancient hanging out together buffing and adding loads of stuff but i didn't really see anyone using it anyway so it feels like something of a moot point but maybe someone out there was always rocking the um the command squad and loving it but i mean i ran it on a couple of occasions and i thought it was fine but yeah i mean at the end of the day oh and then i suppose the last 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 thing is probably actually the most significant change is the is the changes to deathwing terminators because before we could go here's three guys with Thunder Hammer Storm Shields and here's two guys with Cyclone Missile Launchers and here's five guys with Storm Bolters and, you know, you could smush it up in all sorts of different ways. Now you're just basically, a, you're either an Assault Squad or a, well, basically, if you're Deathwing Terminators, you're just standard Terminators. You can't even do, you can't take a Deathwing Terminator Squad that is Assault Terminator based other than Deathwing Knights. So, yeah, when I say not much has changed, I suppose quite a lot had changed, but... um yeah, I don't know how many people really are lamenting the loss of those features, but um, yeah, to me, the Strike Master is the one, and the Talon Master, I suppose, are the two that I'm sad to see go, but at the end of the day, it's progress, isn't it? We got Inner Circle uh, Companions, for God's sakes. What more do you want, eh? Well, I know. Yeah, am I right thinking the Deathwing Knights are old sculpts? They are, yeah, so they've been replaced, yeah, with new sculpts. Oh, but they have got new sculpts. Correct, they yeah, were one yeah. of the ones. Because I knew we got Terminators, and I thought we got other kind of Terminators. This was the ones that had all the, the mauls and other things, and now they've just got mostly swords now. Swords. Oh, actually, no, they've still got the, the maces as well, haven't they? Yeah, so you can still take the maces, but you can have the swords or the maces, basically. But yeah. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, but that's the way that goes. But anyway, there you go. That's Dark Angels, an interesting... Uh, retrospective and or review of that supplement uh, again has been announced uh, is going on pre-order um, by the time this episode comes out so if you want to pick up a Dark Angel Codex supplement and you haven't done so already it will be available for pre-order around the time that this podcast goes out uh, alongside uh, the new character sculpts for Asmodai uh, and Bilal, uh, as well as Inner Circle Companions which uh, let's hope we see a significant points decrease for them because 
at the moment, I don't feel like those are going to be overly successful. But, um, you know, on a long enough timeline, it'll come around. That's true. Indeed. Any final thoughts from you, Phil? Um, I, I think they seem pretty good. Uh, as you say, the things like the Ravenwing missing specific characters, I guess you could say uh, the same with um, the first company, sort of Deathwing style, like you, you're missing some of the Terminator characters if you really wanted to lean into them specifically. And that feels like it's a bit of a fault of the lack of the range with certain armors within the generic space moon range. So maybe they get fixed at some point down the line. Um, but overall, yeah, it seems pretty good. Shame there's no cool special rules about plasma, unless that's hidden away somewhere that we missed. Um, but other than that, yeah, pretty good. I like the three flavors of the detachments. They seem pretty cool. Agreed. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Transitional noise. All right, 40K fans, we've got the segment for you, the battle scroll and accompanying meta watch for Warhammer Age of Sigma. Yay! Everyone's favorite. We're going to wax lyrical about Age of Sigma again. Yay! Uh, I swear, Phil, we're getting ever closer towards rebranding this podcast to the Warhammer podcast, aren't we? Uh, I mean, maybe. Maybe it'll happen. I think so. I think so. We It, it, it feels more and more necessary all the time. Will we have to update the uh, artwork in such an instance? No, oh, po- po- probably, which means it will never happen because that's too much effort. <laughs> well, that's fair. That's fair. I'm Unless we incorporate incorporate some kind of like cities of sigma design aesthetic to the sir oh maybe yeah maybe maybe but anyway you like age of sigma don't you phil well, i do indeed yes when i'm not getting smashed at it but yes i do like it have you ever not been smashed at it yet no it happens quite a lot but you know not as often i don't know it depends on who i'm playing against really fair fair in your recent excursion to the doubles event, what was your total wins? It was two, wasn't it? Two free. It was you went. Two wins, three losses, one smash, and two very close losses that could have been wins if the the winds had blown uh, the right way. Yeah, no, that's fair, mate. That's fair. Uh, me and old Sean managed three wins, two losses, and one of our losses was quite close. We probably, with a little bit more kind of tactical nuance, could have turned that into a win. But it was the last game of the weekend. We were feeling it, uh, so it didn't quite work out on that occasion. But um, no, I love Age of Sigma. It's super fun. Uh, And one of the things I want to say from the outset to anyone who is Age of Sigma curious, listening to the podcast, thinking to themselves, well, I really enjoy 40K, but these guys seem really, you know, taken by Age of Sigma. Uh, one of the things I will say uh, that I really love and appreciate about AOS is kind of personified in these Meta Watch articles and these balance updates. Um, it's really funny when you listen to people like I'll, I'll, I'll name them Rob from Honest Wargamer, for example, because he lives and breathes the Age of Sigma world and he's very knowledgeable and capable of communicating about it. But it's almost like because he's on that kind of all steak diet all the time, the, 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 the age of Sigma perspective, he, he hasn't got that same kind of low sense of expectations that us as like core 40 K players has. So weirdly when things happen within like meta watches or updates, the stuff that uh, people who are more kind of in the, in, in the kind of hardcore AOS scene that don't really play 40 K, they look at these rules things. And they think like, Oh, they could have gone further or that doesn't quite address it the way I'd want it them to. But when you're coming at it from a 40 K perspective, you're like, Oh my God, it's like revolutionary. It's like, they understand, they know what the problem is and they've done things to try and fix it. Oh my God. Cause this meta watch, this balance data like battle scroll thing doesn't just basically go oh that's a bit good make it more expensive oh that's a bit rubbish make it cheaper uh oh here's a couple of kind of catch-all patches that kind of incorporate everything they actually go into like data sheets into specific battle um war scrolls and go we're going to tweak this stat or we're going to change this rule or we're going to you know, really tweak things, which is super interesting. 
Yeah. I, well, I think what's interesting about that is I think earlier in the edition, they didn't actually want to do that because mm. they wanted the um, the the book, the core uh, kind of army book, the battle tomes, and your war scroll pack of cards to be as valid as possible. So I think they've really tried to avoid updating th- those where possible, but where they have done, possibly with the exception of the spells, they've been relatively minor sort of, it feels mostly like stat changes. They haven't like drastically rewritten anything um, with the exception. I think sometimes over the course of the addition of the endless spells, they've changed quite a bit over the duration. And sometimes that's been with the, not in the battle, um, what's this called? The battle scroll updates, but the season updates where, where it's more, much more related to a printed product. Um, where they've done the big changes on the end of spells. Fair, fair. All right, so what have they changed? There's a few bits and pieces. Uh, first of all, they've made some changes to General's Handbook. So uh, we are in the 23 to 24 season, the General's Handbook. This is unique in the sense that it is running for an entire 12-month period. Um, so they began in June of 2023, uh, and this uh, General's Handbook will run until what we assume is the release of fourth edition Age of Sigmar, which is likely to occur in June of 2024. Um, now, the whole kind of idea of this General's Handbook has been to really lean into uh, wizards. There's been this and uh, and Dorian locus mechanic. That's the words, isn't it? Yeah, that's a wizard on foot under, I think, 10 wings. Yeah, and they've really... And not named. In, and not named, yes. And they've really leaned into that as kind of being one of the core mechanics they've given them their own spells which incorporates mm-hmm. one of the most devastating spells which is the merciless blizzard um, but they've also got things like hoarfrost which is actually incredibly powerful uh, because essentially imagine if you will a spell or a psychic power if you're talking 40k that buffs your to hit roll your to wound roll or even or rather sorry your ap or damage uh, to no, not damage. Oh, not damage. Hit, right. hit wound and AP. AP, basically. that was it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy, right? Like it's it's a very powerful spell. Um, however, as a counterbalance to that, they have had rules that essentially reward you or offer opportunities for you to do things if you have no wizards, um, because obviously in a world where there are wizards. There are also people who don't very much like wizards uh, and then go about trying to kill them. Uh, so there was this core battalion, uh, the wizard finders of uh, Andor, the, the magic hunters, uh, before it basically, forgive me if I'm wrong here, Phil, the only benefit of this battalion was, I think you got re-roll hits against wizards if you were targeting wizards with anyone from this battalion. That was um, it, right? I'm not 100% certain because I never really bothered looking at it because I had wizards, uh, but I think you are correct, yeah. Yeah, it was literally, if you're targeting a wizard, you can reroll hits on wizards. But now, in addition, you also now have uh, the ability to ignore the effects of spells or the effects of endless spells on a 5-plus roll. So essentially, each time a unit in this battalion is affected by a spell cast by an enemy unit or an ability of an endless spell summoned by an enemy unit, you roll a dice on a 5-plus, you ignore it. Um, really, really nice buff makes that detachment, that battalion a lot more viable than it was previously. Yeah. No, really good. Yeah. So again, I don't think we really need to dwell on that more than we already have, uh, battle tactics. Uh, so battle tactics again for our 40 K listeners, these are essentially your secondary missions. So when you're playing Leviathan deck in 10th edition and you draw deploy teleport homers, uh, in age of Sigma, you pick, a battle tactic at the start of your turn. And if you accomplish that battle tactic, you are rewarded uh, the allocated amount of victory points. Typically two. There may be some instances where they're worth less or more, but almost always two as far as yes, I'm aware. For I'm pretty tactics. sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we've got drain their power. Uh, you complete this battle tactic at the end of your turn. If a friendly hero with a nullstone adornment is contesting an objective uh, that was controlled by your opponent at the start of your turn. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I don't know well, what it was before. Uh, well, the, no, so this is a new one. So Ooh. what was interesting is the battle tactics leaned much more in favour of having a wizard casting spells 
there was one specifically around killing a wizard uh, that had cast an endless spell uh, or potentially stealing the endless spell, but not dispelling it. Um, so there wasn't much play in terms of choices for uh, basically being the anti-wizard meta army list. Uh, it's worth saying, so it's a hero with a null stone adornment, which is a special enhancement that you can have if you don't have a wizard in your um, army. Mm. There was, I think there was three, and they're normally like around being able to dispel magic um, or making a wizard forget spells. So, stuff like that. There were some quite interesting ones. So is that, that, that that dust one, isn't there, where you can activate it in your command phase and you roll for every endless spell on the board and on a five plus it goes away or something. So you yeah, roll the, there was quite a few good ones uh, for sure. But the yeah the sec- the secondaries the battle tactics were quite difficult to achieve, uh, even the ones with wizards. Uh, so it's nice that they've sort of. Acknowledge that if you're doing the anti wizard option, it was a bit more difficult for you. So they've added this new one in, which is cool. Personally, I'd like mm. to have seen a couple more just generic ones to make it a touch easier sometimes to do them because I, t- I tend to find by turn four and five, you're really struggling to find a battle tactic that you can actually do. Um, yeah, but that that's where the strategic layers are really well, kind of brought to the fore, isn't it? And that's that is where. True. Yeah, but I, yeah. I feel like the disparity of some factions have very difficult uh, battle tactics that you can lean into because not only uh, the, there's there's six in the generic um, general's handbook, and well, then seven now have, apparently. Yeah, but, but there's normally some generic ones in your book that you can also do as well, and some factions have an easier time doing those faction specific ones than others. Um, so having a couple more generic ones, I think, is quite good. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, and then lastly, we have the battle plan, which is basically a uh, type of uh, mission. Uh, so power flux victory points, change the fourth bullet point to score one victory point. If any enemy wizard uh, units were destroyed in that battle round, this victory point is scored at the end of the battle round instead of at the end of each turn. Um, I'm, again, not completely confident with what that's changed, but again, Whatever it is, a nice clarification, I'm sure, uh, in terms of um, what that represents. So, yeah, those are kind of the the, the, the key kind of battle scroll uh, changes there. There were some changes to kind of like core rules in terms of when stuff happens and when other things happen. So, like, when you resolve a certain thing and when you do a certain thing. We're not going to go into that because that's really in the weeds. We're just going to stick to the stuff that's in this battle scroll update. Uh, again, we already mentioned him. Uh, Rob from Honest Wargamer did a really good breakdown of all of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, if you want it from more of a kind of veteran player's perspective, highly recommend check that out because um, it gets a little bit more in the weeds. But we're going to just stick to the stuff that's here in this PDF, right, Phil? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, it's quite a lot to get through as it is, so <laughs> yeah. sensible. Yeah, ain't that the truth? Uh, right, okay, cool. So we've got the Grand Alliance of Chaosville. Why don't you tell uh, us what's no, happened you've, with those? You, you, you've skipped one out. There's the endless Oh, spell God, you range. want to mention the uh, fact that the range has changed to nine. Well, I thought you were going to do them all, yeah. Uh, so, yes, that's all it is. Blades of Corn. Um, yes. So, <laughs> Well, you may as well explain exactly what it is now, Phil. An endless spell. The... Uh, and then the spell, um, and basically... Um, when it's removed from play, um, it it scores points as as it goes on, and then when it is removed from play, it explodes. Uh, and basically, when it explodes, each enemy unit um, suffers D three mortal wounds. I think it used to be like twelve inches, or maybe it was more. It's now yeah. within nine inches, so they've toned it down because it was seen as quite good. Yeah, it's definitely a debuff rather than the opposite. Um, yeah, because it was like basically a massive bomb, wasn't it? You like just sort of set it off and bam. Yes, do... yeah, yeah. It could do lots of mortal wounds, which is really good. Uh, yeah, for blades of corn, you've got hatred of sorcery, which I think Dan's talked about potentially in um, another segment. Where we talked about it in the Dark Angel segment for some reason. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the interesting thing about this is thematically, um, obviously, your corn, you hate wizards. But you can still ally in wizards uh, from like Zinch, Slanesh, wherever. Um, and they, the rules writers thought that was a bit 
unthematic. So basically, I've added in this extra rule, uh, hatred of sorcery. So each time a friendly unit casts a spell, you must roll a dice on a five plus. That spell is automatically unbound, so it doesn't get cast. Um, it is Matt, isn't it? From um, the yes, yeah, yeah for the rules writing team. Yeah. yeah, he was basically saying yes. Corn doesn't like spells happening anywhere near his army, so um, uh, this is a nice sort of random enough to make people think twice about including wizards in their corn army. Um, but especially at a competitive level where people probably don't like the sort of random num- number generator stuff and they want to be able to do stuff a bit more consistently. Um, this seems thematic and hopefully will tone down the amount of occurrences where people are taking wizards in an army that shouldn't have wizards. So this is a yeah. really nice change. It's a great change. Again, it's sort of what it, again it what it demonstrates is again again something that feels like a really good understanding of the rules understanding of the desired outcome uh and a sequence of decisions that comes to a very flavorsome a very appropriate solution to a problem um again a one in three chance that a spell doesn't go off isn't that punishing but it's punishing enough when you need those spells to be reliable. Um, you know, a one in three chance that something doesn't happen is not great odds. So yeah, really like it. Um, I also really like the fact that it's a five plus rather than a, a one or two. Uh, again, obviously makes sense in terms of just simplified language around the rules. Five plus, I suppose is easier to communicate than on the roll of a one or two or, uh, you know, or, or yes, on a, even on a though, three. Yeah, even though rolls of one and two are normally seen as bad. Yeah. Um, as you say, five plus is a simplified, but does the same effect in terms what, of. What I like about it is it speaks to the fact that Corn wants to stop the magic. So it's kind mm. of like a five plus, it's a good thing because Corn's yes. like, none of that. <laughs> you know, so it's a, again, it's a subtle, but actually quite nice little rule nuance that because it's associated with a positive outcome. Five pluses are typically things like invun saves or ward saves or whatever. Rolling a five plus is usually a positive. So from Corn's perspective, it's like, yes, this is good. Stop that magic, uh, which is cool. Um, Magakin of Nurgle uh, specifically seen changes to the Sloppity Bell Piper or Bar Piper. Uh, change my love is like a ripe, ripe fart. Uh, to subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target friendly Nurgle demon units, wholly within 14 of any uh, Sloppity Bell Piper. Now, again, within the confines of Warhammer 40,000, we saw with their uh, update that they were having issues with things like the changeling because people would take one changeling and the way they tried to get around that is they said, look, you can't just take one changeling. You have to take one unit of horrors and a changeling if that's what you want to do. In Magakin and Nurgle, their gimmick is they summon stuff. And what they were doing before is they were summoning the Sloppity Bypiper because he was quite cheap to summon. But what he basically used to do was stop you from piling in um, or, yeah, basically stopped you from moving, essentially, um, which was massive. Uh, he, he would really, really shut down um, the efficiency of your combat units and he'd just come in and do that. So now... He is subtracting one from hit rolls. Still a very meaningful debuff, but nowhere near as punishing to your opponent as what it was before. So again, really nice change. Um, and, and to me, kind of showcases a really cool way of addressing a problem. If you apply the same logic to 40k and you look at the changeling problem, it's like, well, why don't you just change the changeling's ability to make it a little less impactful um, rather than kind of making them have to pay this additional tax because you're not really removing the problem. You're just basically making it cost more. Uh, whereas with this, they've actually gone, no, no, we'll change the rule, which, yeah. I don't know. What was your vibe on that, Phil? Uh, yeah, no, it seemed like a good one. It sounded like it was a specific problem when you comboed in another unit, which also sort of uh, made your opponent's army sort of uninteractive with yours because you just couldn't therefore ever get in combat pretty much. Uh, and obviously combat's the main way of killing stuff in AOS, so that key was a bit of a problem. So it's nice, that, as you say, you sometimes need to uh, change the data sheet and not just points. 
points get, only gets you so far, but when there's a sort of fundamental problem with a unit on a rules level, it is good that they're willing to change that. So yeah, it seems, it seems all right. The, uh, admittedly, these changes, let's be fair, are probably all quite high level sort of tournaments play, I would assume. I wouldn't have thought many casual players would necessarily have come across any or many of these interactions, uh, but it's still good that they uh, have fixed them. And I mean, and and that's one of the great things I think as well with AOS at the moment is because kind of kind of from a core rules perspective, although they've nuanced certain things and finessed certain sequencing and changed stuff, the game that's published in the uh, AOS third edition rulebook is not drastically removed from what you're playing in tournament settings. Um, so weirdly, it doesn't feel like they've not gone in there and made like massive sweeping changes to certain kind of core rules. So like something like the mortal wound system, they've not overhauled that like they have in 40 K. They have, for example, changed the way that certain items works, data sheets work. They have made those changes. Um, but it's core cool rules ideas still kind of remain broadly the same, um, which I think is the upside of the way they've done it. So again, if you're playing with mates uh, and they're running the sloppity bell piper and it's annoying, it, you know, it's, it's not, this change is good. And if you're aware of it, you can implement it. But if you're not, and you're just running the book stuff, as Phil said, you're probably not really seeing the negatives, but um, yeah, it's good that it's in there. Um, Beats of chaos, both, Gores and Zangors have had their range uh, of their weapons increased from one inch to two inch. So again, what this means within the confines of Age of Sigmar is it just means that more people are, uh, can attack. So in 40k, you're used to uh, basically getting something within half an inch, and then you're used to getting, or rather, sorry, you're used to having something within an inch, and then you'll basically need to have stuff in base contact with the thing that's within an inch in order to kind of maximize your attack. So if you have like four models and they're in a line, the uh, front guy that's within an inch attacks, and then the guy that touches that base can also attack. In Age of Sigmar, it's different. Basically, it's all done with measurements. So effectively, um, you know, if for whatever reason, the thing that you were behind was on a 2.5 inch base, you wouldn't be able to target. But yeah, it's a meaningful change. Basically. Yeah. So weapon ranges in AOS go from one inch to three inches. Predominantly, mm. most stuff is one. Some stuff is two. Very rare big stuff like giants is free, for example. Um, and yeah, throughout these, um, we've seen some changes to make stuff on slightly bigger bases go up to two inches. And I feel like it's kind of where actually. I'm trying to think if it's always where appropriate. Not always. I think sometimes a lot of the things is like great swords, great blades, that sort of makes sense because they are big weapons. Um, I think Haradans for Night Haunts aren't particularly big, but I think they have also changed them as well. We can double check when we get to the Night Haunt segment. Um, so yeah, I think sometimes it's thematic, other times it's just more of a buff to the army overall. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, again, the idea of things like the gore unit was that they're very much from that kind of old world fantasy era of miniatures. So they're much more kind of like rank and file style guys. So the idea is, is they kind of come together and fight. And this was something that was available to people in older General's Handbook. So we used to have the Galician champions, and the Galician veterans, and the Galician veterans used to basically get this kind of like rank fighting bonus where they used to be able to attack similar to how we're used to things working in 40k um that has gone away in this current thing so increasing the range to two is really useful um skaven are next they've basically uh made their token battle tactic even easier to do um so one of the gimmicks that they run in age of sigma quite regularly is uh if an army is underperforming they basically look at their special secondary objectives and go, how's about we give them an easy one? Uh, and they did that for Skaven. Uh, but then what they did on top of that is they went, how's about we make the easy one even easier? So previously you used to have a, have to have a friendly Skaven unit and a Skaven hero uh, retreat. Now it's just any two Skaven units, um, which is very on, you know, on theme for Skaven, wouldn't you say so, Phil? Yeah. 
Run away, little Run rattles. away! Get into the tunnels! If anyone's played like Vermintide, they definitely don't like running away nearly as much. No, um, they just run into you until they die. Yes, exactly. Um, and then Plague Monks become 20 person units. That's their like minimum unit size now, though. So that's both a cool and annoying oh. thing. Um, yeah, because I, well, I assumed it was ten, but you could reinforce it, which is a d- doubling the unit size to twenty. Well, you could already now reinforce. It's... You could reinforce it up to thirty. Oh yes, uh, if it's battle line, then yeah, you could do it twice. So yeah, yeah. so I think now they can become a sixty plague wow. monk unit now. Big. That is a big old blob of smelly rats. Yeah, your uh, your rat king would have much recruitment in the in that particular uh, mm-hmm. mess. True, true indeed. Um, yeah, next up is uh, Slaves to Darkness with the Demon Prince. He changes the attack characteristics of the Demonic Axe and Hellforge Sword to 7 and changes the attack characteristic of the Malefic Talons to 12. I assume it's just a buff and that those attacks have gone up rather than down. Yeah, I think he was uh, with the uh, Axe and Sword before. I feel like he was either 4 or 5 attacks. No um yeah, meaningful buff. I mean, you have played against Richie uh, a bunch of times with yes. Slaves to Darkness, right? The Demon Prince was the most underwhelming thing. Yes, uh, that's true, And there were definitely a lot of instances where you'd have a hero. So one of the things with Slaves to Darkness is they have this, like, chaos boom table. And if they do really well, they become a Demon Prince. But there are definitely instances where you're like, I don't really want to be a Demon Prince because Demon Princes are worse than what I am. Uh, whereas now maybe there's more of an argument that you'll be like, actually, this is all right, you know. Um, so maybe it's not that you're fielding them or taking them in your army list, but maybe it is that you're building more strategies around trying to become one um, because it might be that sorcerers or other kind of on-foot characters becoming demon princes becomes more impactful potentially. Yeah. I mean, Richard's main aim of every game is just to turn something into a demon prince. That is like his sort of own personal quest. Uh, when well, it's also it. his army's grand strategy, isn't it? Oh, of course. Yeah, that's why he tries to do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is grand, strat- gra- grand strategy, again, being the overarching kind of like thing Second that you're trying general. to do in a game. Mm. Yeah. So imagine imagine the, strateg- the, the, the secondary objectives, but then one big kind of overall thing. So... Um, yeah, like Slay the Warlord used to be in older editions, like that kind of level, except it's custom to your needs. I'm really approaching this, by the way, Phil, if you haven't caught on to this already, I'm really approaching the, this from the, the 40k player's perspective on what Age of Sigma is. That's yeah, kind of feels well, like, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, that feels like the unique angle that I'm going for here. Um Disciples of Zinch. Uh, Zangors have had their range increased to two. You already knew that from Beast of Chaos, but it does also apply to the Disciples of Zinch. You get access to Zangors as well. Uh, and they're changing uh, blue and uh, iridescent horrors. Oh, sorry, brimstone horrors, not iridescent. Uh, Ooh, blue and, I don't know, I made them up. They sound great, don't they? What's some of them? Uh, anyway, blue horrors and brimstone horrors are now battle lines. So you can still take pink horrors, and pink horrors are still really really strong uh but yeah you can take blue horrors or um brimstone horrors uh, as yes so you can just liner. start them off as blue or brimstone whereas i think before they had to be pink and they would break down into the um the others as you went so that's interesting yeah. Well, it's, it's it's interesting for two reasons. Number one, because it gives you more battle line options. Number two, because pink horrors are really good. But they're also really expensive, both in points and in miniatures, because you have to have, obviously, a full complement of pinks. Then you have to have the full complement of blues. Then you have to have the full complement of brimstone. So you have to have this, like, whole collection for one unit that, again, runs you, like, 260 points or something like that. It's a very expensive battle line unit, whereas now you can just go, nah, I'll just take some blues or I'll take some brimstones. Happy days. Um, so those are the forces of chaos. Any standouts to you, Phil? Uh, anything you're especially excited to see there? Um, I think the hatred of sorcery for corns the most interesting one because it's like a cool thematic fix to a problem. Like they didn't just say, "Oh, you can't include them," and they didn't just say, "Oh, if you do include them, the points go up." It's like an in-game mechanic that feels very thematic and law accurate to 
Vix uh, effectively a tournament gamey uh, thing people were doing. Yeah, it's like the old boots on the ground rule. Very cool, thematical, interesting decision. For me, I'm going to shout out the Demon Prince change because of Richie. I know Richie will appreciate it. I'm maybe not looking forward to facing Being on the more. receiving end. So. Yeah, exactly. But it's cool that they've done it. Um, so, yeah, really nice. Uh, next is the Grand Alliance of Order. Order is quite a vast uh, arrangement of uh, options. Um, first and foremost, we have the Stormcast Eternals. Basically, Vanquishers have increased their range of their Celestial Gate Swords to two. Um, I'm not overly familiar with the Vanquisher unit, but... It now uh, has a range of two. So yes, well done they're some one of the units I've got. So they've just got big swords. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're kind of cool. Yeah, wicked. Otherwise, yeah, that's it for Stormcast Eternals. Uh, Luminef Realm Lords have no changes. So next is the Seraphon. Phil, you have a Seraphon army. Tell us what they've done. Vaguely. Uh, yeah, so the Starborn Command trait, uh, Lord of Celestial Resonance. So it gets changed to the first time each phase that this general either successfully casts a spell that is not unbound, successfully unbinds a spell, or successfully dispels and then the spell. You receive two cosmic power points instead of one. I think these are effectively like summoning points of some kind that allow you to do stuff once you've got them. I believe they've changed it to effectively the first time that phase that you do it. Uh, rather than pretty much every time you unbind a spell where you, so you could basically get loads of points really easily. So they've toned that down because it was very good beforehand. Yeah, yeah. Good change on that side of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Croxagors um, and Croxagor Warspawned, which are the big boys, um, have gone up in wounds from four to five. Um, and then the knock-on effect of that is because they're five wounds, their OC characteristic, uh, I don't actually know what the correct word is in Age of Sigma. Um, they count as two two models. Y- y- uh, yes, they, they count as more models uh, for the purposes of contesting objectives like OC is. Uh, so because they go up to, yeah, five is where you count as two uh, rather than um, one. Yeah. yeah. I believe. So again, um, really meaningful change for those guys. Gives them a lot of really good utility, uh, makes them more durable, which is no bad thing. Um, so yeah, good change on the uh, the Croxagors there for sure. Uh, definitely necessary. Um, Caesar Sigma has been something of a boogeyman uh, in games of Age of Sigma since they came about. They've got a number of um, issues that needed to be addressed, but one of the kind of core elements of it uh, was this. Um, blazing weapons ability they've got two issues they've got this and then they've got their what's it called phil the command squad thing that they take that is, there's only oh, ever yeah. really supposed to be one of them but because they were quite cheap people took like two of them and they they were like buffing stuff and healing stuff and doing yes all sorts of I've, I, I came across that command squad um yes yeah, so it's yeah. a command squad with a bunch of different characters in it and each character yeah. has an individual ability um, and they mm. said you only really meant to have one of them. So I, th- I guess they've changed that, but they've not changed it specifically here, right? So I don't know if they've done that in. They've just the... drastically imp- increased the cost. I think. The ah, points have gone up, okay. Basically. To make you take less of them. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It just becomes less of a you know guaranteed thing for them. So the unit I am trying to find the name of. Yeah, the Free Guild Command Corp, um, which, uh, yeah, previously, yeah, people were taking in abundance. Maybe they won't do so much now. Uh, But, yeah, so we got the Blazing Weapons change, which is essentially what it used to be was, is uh, while this unit has Blazing Weapons, each unmodified hit roll of six uh, for attack made uh, did one mortal wound in addition, but now that only applies to melee. So Cities of Sigmar had a lot of shooting, uh, and that sh- those shooting attacks would benefit from this blazing weapon ability. Now they don't. Um, so that has really impacted the overall damage output of their ranged um, options, which is, to be fair, a really sensible change in conjunction with the points increases. I feel like this is a good sort of set of initial changes to cities. 
again, we'll see what comes down the pipe with cities as they start to further address and understand the nuances of it. I think the book is very vast and got a lot of like potential within it. Um, people definitely leaned into specific types of builds uh, early on, and there's still like a lot of things that they can explore and express with it. Um, I would love to see some stuff in cities that buffs or gives some sort of incentive for the dwarf or dwarden units. That that element of the book feels really under under like appreciated at the moment. Um, the elf stuff seems okay because elves can't help but be good uh, in Games Workshop systems. But yeah, it'd be cool if they could add a few more things to cities that weren't just benefiting humans and elves. Think about the dwarves, right, Phil? Give the dwarves some love. Exactly. Um, yeah, so they either need a sort of second wave where they do the elves and dwarves, give them new models in line with the current Cities of Sigma range refresh, or personally, I'm a bit like, just get rid of them. Um, just just have Cities of Sigma as the humans, but that's not really what they're meant to be. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with the um, the other bits. I mean, I love the fact that um, I love the fact that it got all these layers, and it's a place where you can bring your kind of old world collection into the game of Age of Sigma. Uh, definitely, as more and more people are starting to get on board with old world as well. There's, you know, at the end of the day, if you're collecting a dwarf army in old world, why not? Uh, you know, also put them on round bases and use them in Age of Sigma. Just the problem is at the moment is is in the game of Old World, they're quite good. Uh, but in the game of Age of Sigma, they're pretty underwhelming. So, uh, yeah, it's um, it's one of those uh, trade-offs, I suppose. Uh, what did the Deepkin get, Phil? Do you even understand as, um, as a point of reference? Because Deepkin not- are kind of beyond my comprehension. I don't really know what their gimmick is. I've only played against them once, and I, and I didn't really understand what was going on other than the fact that they shot and or had sharks. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I was going to say, Doors of Cain are there, but they don't get any updates. Um, yeah, let's have a look yeah. through the RNF Deepkin, see if we can work it out. So, uh, <laughs> you change the Bloodthirsty Shiver rule. Uh, you can only include Bloodthirsty Shivers in your army if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made by unit in a Bloodthirsty Shiver is a six. That attack automatically wounds, do not make a wound roll. Um, Okay, uh, I, I, I don't exactly know what you I changed, but I guess include, I made it I pretty you said, harder. You I can you include you can bloodthirsty, only... yeah, you can include bloodthirsty shivers in your army. Um, mm. uh, so I don't know if that's a unit, maybe? Who knows? Who knows, um, mate? Who knows? The IDFT can, as I say, uh, elude me. And but again, they, they've basically the got C- lethal hits. Well done, then. Uh, the aspect of the C ability, uh, I don't know who has it, but it's clearly a spell, and it now oh, has a casting value um, of 7 or I, 8 or 18. Well, it's Eidolon. So I think he... I Eidolon! Suspect, I suspect he's the big guy um, with the water cape. I, I don't know if that's true, but that's what I want to believe. That, that's fair. I mean, you know, he looks like the kind of guy that would have a water cape. Um, I found the model, yeah, Eidolon. There we go. There he is. The man himself. Uh, so, yeah, that's either better or worse. I, I don't know. Um, maybe, Phil, one of us needs to play Iden F. Deepkin. We need to expand our knowledge. No, oh, no, it can't be those cheeky elves. No, you, you draw the line at the elves. I, I'm, a, I'm a dwarf through and through, yeah. No, fair, fair. Um, Fire Slayers, uh, you got an increase of ranges, basically, so... Berserkers um, with bladed uh, sling shields go up to range two, uh, and Berserkers with uh, f- um, hand axes also have their range increased to two. So good for the Fire Slayers. Um, intriguingly, no updates that I can see here for the Sylvaneff. Sylvaneff just got av- ignored. Uh, I probably because as we know, uh, elves are pretty good, so they're probably too good to need. An I don't know, man. Like Sylvan, I feel or like they just... an army in trouble. But again, I think it's weirdly. 
And I only know this from like talking to people who have sort of expressed an interest in playing Age of Sigmar. A lot of people drawn to the Sylvaneth. They look like a cool army that people want to collect. I feel yeah. like Sylvaneth is one of those armies that people buy into really early on. Um, well, Richard and then- nearly went for them. In fact, he actually bought a, uh, an, uh, an army box of them, but then changed yeah. his mind um, and went for Chaos instead. Yeah, so, I mean, I feel like that's the case, that there's a lot of people with them, but only a few people who actually know how to play them. So maybe that's what kind of uh, creates the problem there. Anyway, Phil, we're going to move on to the Grand Alliance of Death now. And the first thing, why don't you tell us? I mean, admittedly, there's not much to tell, but it's Nighthorns, Phil. Yes. Uh, so Blade Geist Revenants, which are the ones with the big swords. Uh, Dread Scythe Harridans, which are the ladies with the arm claws. Uh, and the Glaive Wraith Stalkers all increased the range of their weapons to two inches um, Good rather than one inch, which I get is a buff because they're all on, um, I think, 32 mil bases. So they get, you know, you can get a second rank in, which is quite good. As I was saying, Harridans have quite short visually looking weapons. So they should technically, I would say, be on one inch. Um, the yeah, Re- Blade Guys Revenants have very big swords, so they should be on two inches. Um, the interesting updates, but not meaningful, I would say, doesn't buff my army whatsoever because I don't have any of these built and painted. Um, although I've got a couple of units of Glade Wraith Stalkers paint as so I built, but they are wildly considered as the worst unit in the entire game. So no one even now would still take them uh, other than me because I just had lots of the models and I thought they kind of look cool. Uh, and they fit with the theme of the, my army that I'm going for. Um, so Night Haunt, this is where I get my soapbox and have a little rant, Dan, if you can excuse me. Uh, normally I'd be like, oh, these updates are really good, really meaningful. I think Nighthawk have been pretty much the bottom faction or the bo- in the bottom five factions or even three factions for the last two or three like meta watches. So almost for the, the best part of a year. In fact, I think since I've collected them, so over a year, they've been in the bottom ranks. Um, and they haven't really had any kind of substantial update for them. They got an update to their battle tactic one time, which actually made it harder for them to achieve rather than easier, um, which sort of made sense in terms of the, the way it was written. It was kind of bad. Um, but yeah, there's no other meaningful buffs. The range stuff in isolation, you go, oh, that's cool that they've done that to them. But then actually you see that they've literally done it to every other army. So they haven't really buffed this army at all. What they've done is they buffed the internal uh, balance of the army. So people will more likely take these units. Um, I believe that Revenants and Harridans are particularly good in some of the other sub factions. So people might be taking those over the Emerald Host, which is the one I play. So it's interesting, but it's actually quite rubbish, I would say. Uh, I feel like someone at uh, Games Workshop, AOS team just doesn't like Night Haunts and they don't bother with them. Give me some love. That's what I want. See, I don't think that's entirely true, though, right? I think the situation with Night Haunts at the moment is is that I feel like they probably need a deeper dive. And I think at the moment, the team were probably more focused on neutralizing some of the bigger problems um, and... Yeah, like, I get what you're saying, right? You want your Drakari update, right? You want like, what the mm-hmm. Drakari got in 40k. You want a whole new detachment, loads of new rules. Um, and I think that's coming. Um, it'd be interesting I mean, to imagine. I, I think this is the thing, right? It's like, yeah, what is on the horizon for these guys? Because I remember when listening to the actual Meta Watch um, YouTube video, Matt specifically called out the Night Haunts were in his radar like he saw them as a problem but it is intriguing to imagine well what are those fixes going to be because i know now that in the new dawnbringer book uh, there's a new death regiment of renown which i think complements night haunts really well uh admittedly it's not a night haunt regiment no that is a the, death regiment the is- um, issue with them is that you have to take a, a an allied regiment of renown yeah regiment uh to 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 buff your night haunt which is mm, yeah Um, yeah 
Interesting. I'm a bit like, yes, it's on your radar, but it should have been for the last year. I feel yeah. like the problem is they're sort of at the bottom, but they're still within the 45, 55% win rate, even though they're pretty much always 45, 47% win yeah. rate. So yeah, 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 yeah. They don't ever feel like the need to necessarily justify buffing them. Yeah. Even though it sort of feels like, yeah, they, they do need something. Yeah, I agree. I think um, the thing is, is like, Again, I don't know with Night Horns whether it's a. Uh, Are you a, saying it's a it's a me thing versus a a, a Night Horn thing? Uh, no, no, no. I'm not saying that at all. Although obviously there is a chance that that's true. Well, I I, th- I think there is to an extent because uh, obviously I've only got a thousand points built, so uh, yeah. I'm playing very thematic army with lots of horses. They're considered quite a good unit, so I guess that's why they wouldn't necessarily buff them. They could do with having the two inch range that's something you always yeah, totally agree. say to me uh because on average you'll get maybe two or three of them into combat and the other two uh are just sort of hanging out doing nothing um so i yeah if they had done that that would have been a meaningful update that i would actually go oh actually that makes my personal army much better i just feel like because i've got a bit of a sort of nichely themed army this doesn't really affect me. Although saying that, I know lots of people take hex, hex wraiths, but in a two thousand point game, you have lo- loads of hex wraiths plus lots of these other units, and these are, you know, the the blade Geist and revenants and the harridans tend to be the big hitters in people's armies anyway. Um, there's also, I think, Grimgast Reapers, which uh, I, I assume they have the two inch range already, so they've taken a bit of a hit in comparison. Um, I think. And as I said, Glaive Wraith Stalkers pretty much no one takes anyway because they're a bit too niche. Yeah. But there are lots of interesting regiments of renown for death specifically in, in the new Mad King Rises. Um, so, yeah, certainly something that you can look at to, to amplify what you have. But at the same time, I always feel like the thing is with those regiments of renown is, is unless you're really aspiring to collect a second force, it's like you're a Nighthorn player, we're heading into the fourth edition of AOS, <clears throat> Just stick with the night horns because in yes. all likelihood, yeah, but, that regiment of renown won't be around in six yeah, months' time. Quite likely. I mean, in theory, if they're doing a minor update and all the battle tomes are still going to be accurate, they're not, you know, indexing them, let's say, and all the regiment of renowns and armies of renown are staying valid, then yes, these books should last you through to the next edition at least until those armies get new battle tomes Mm, so it mm. could last but at the same time part of me is like why take the risk you don't necessarily know i really hope that they would still be valid into the next edition because if they're resetting everything that would potentially worry me as to what the state of the game will be like um also just means your stuff is you know, you don't have to be a world eaters or a guard player that has a codex valid for literally two months. You you get more longevity out of these um, kind of campaign books where, yeah, where this where these rules exist. No, I totally agree. I think at the end of the day, I I picked up the uh, rabble rouser because I already have gloom spies, so it wasn't like a problem to get the rabble rouser uh, uh, regiment of renown. Mm. But yeah, I wouldn't you know other regiments are renowned for destruction i'm not looking at going oh i really need those now because you know i really want to run ogamore tribes or or or, or um sons of bayham it's like i don't really want that stuff so i'm just staying clear of that for that um Oziart Bone Reapers. So No Myriad is like the main way that most people play the Bone Reapers. Um, as I understand it in the competitive sense, the uh, the Bone Reapers were really good for a while. These days they're kind of mid, but they're still pretty meaningful. Definitely some great generals out there that use them with great effect. And many of those that do so are using them as No Myriad. And uh, essentially they've changed the Aldrich Nulls uh, rule to you can reroll a dice each time a friendly No Myriad unit is affected by a spell cast by an enemy unit or the abilities of an end of spell summoned uh, by the enemy unit on a four plus ignore the effects of that spell or the effect of that endless spell ability on that unit. Don't remember what that was before. I assume it was more powerful, so this does feel like a little bit of a nerf for them. But at the end of the day, um, from what I understood, Null Myriad's pretty good anyway. Um, I know a guy who uh, plays at our local club 
uh, on a weekly basis with his null myriad or like bone reapers. Um, so I've heard many stories about their durability. Played against them myself, in fact. Um, so uh, yeah, I yeah. think I think it was a two plus before from the that Metal was it, video, yes. if I recall, which is and it was um, crazy good. And it was like an aura, wasn't it? It was like specifically a specific unit did it. And it was a two plus, so it basically was too powerful. Whereas now yeah. it's like any unit, but it's a four plus. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's oh, it. Exactly. There we go. That, that those those couple games against uh, my uh, you know club attending chum and his bone reapers pays off. Um, so sort of like grave lords have only had one change to the battle tactic of the grasping dead uh, change uh, to pick one friendly summon unit when free of enemy units. Uh, you complete this tactic if any models were slain by that friendly unit this turn, and that friendly unit has been free of enemy enemy unit at the end of this turn. So the changes there is that basically you used to get this battle tactic by having an enemy, uh, well, having a unit within free of an enemy unit, but you didn't have to kill anything before, whereas <laughs> now you do. So, okay. so your big twenty man blob of zombies can stand next to something, but it has to also try and kill it. Um, which isn't too difficult if it's a unit of, you know, a plague rat zombie things, or, um, I don't know, uh, you know, some sort of night haunt thing, uh, you know, a chain rasp. But if you're running into a more crusher, say, uh, you're probably going to have a harder time, uh, getting rid of that. So yeah, definitely makes that battle tactic slightly more nuanced, shall we say? Hmm. That's good. There we go. Uh, grand. Oh, we, we didn't do the summarizing of the thing we thought was most interesting. To be honest with you, the changes to the death factions, it's pretty, you know, they're all pretty middling. I don't think there's anything there that's extraordinarily no. interesting. No, I think potentially the Bone Reapers ones is more interesting from taking something that was specifically broken. Um, yeah, the Night Hall stuff is interesting if you've got those units. I think they will potentially make a big difference. Yeah. Not enough to... I th- get, need something else. Need something else. Come on. Come on, yeah, Matt. Yeah. Sort me out. Sort it out, Matt. Come on. Uh, Grand Alliance of Destruction. My alliance. My uh, happy place. Uh, Auric Warclans. My army of choice. Uh, basically, Auric Warclans is a weird book because it's three books in one. Uh, and it's technically four books because you can either take them as uh, bone splitters, iron jaws, or crawl boys, or you can smush them all together and take them as big war. And big war was really powerful, um, not just because you had access to some really good units, um, but also you had access to a bunch of different battle tactics uh, that were all quite easy to do. They have changed that now. So basically, if you want to do the Cruel Boys battle tactic, you have to have the Cruel Boys keyword on your army general. And if you want to do the Iron Jaws battle tactic, you have to have the Iron Jaws keyword on your Iron Jaws general. So basically, that's our turf and sneak up. Used to be that you used to just use a portion of your army to perform those battle tactics, and they were super easy. Uh, sneak up, for example, is all crawl boys units have to be within three inches or on a piece of terrain. It was like, well, that's super easy, especially in big war armies where the only crawl boys unit you had uh, was one character. So you just be like, well, that one character is on or within three of a piece of terrain. Jobs are good. And- uh, and then that's our turf was basically having two units with three at the center, which again, for Iron Jaws is like super easy. Um, so that's a meaningful change. It definitely, uh, reduces the overall efficiency of Big War. Um, again, Auric War Clans have only really seen point reductions across the board. So, um, I think Big War is still a very real and very tangible army. Um, it just doesn't quite get all of the battle tactics as easily as it did before. Bearing in mind that only these two sneak up and that's our turf have been altered here. Uh, the uh, battle tactics that were already present in Auric war clans still basically can be, uh, Oh, actually, no, I think even in those instances, you still had to have, yeah, those, I think you already had the stipulation in play. Um, so fine. Doesn't really massively change that. Um, 
So that's one of the uh, first changes to uh, Auric Warclans. And then the second or final one uh, is the Moor Grunter with Hacking Crew uh, and uh, the Moor Grunter Gorges uh, Tusk Boss. So basically these are the two uh, types of um, big pigs with uh, guys on the side. Uh, they want you to change the last sentence of the unstoppable momentum ability to at the end of the battle round, subtract one from that unit's momentum score to a minimum of one. Um, that used to be at the end of turn, basically. Um, so it used to be more punishing, whereas now it's slightly less bad. Um, and also before, well, also this unit has also had a points reduction. So I think Auric War Clans are looking pretty spicy at the moment. Uh, I think Big War is in a really good spot because you've had point reductions across the board, uh, not to the kind of key pieces that make up uh, the key components of uh, Big War, but you haven't seen increases. Like the War Chanter is still 120. Uh, Gobsprack is still like 250. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Big War is in a really good really good place. Um which I suppose could be annoying for some, but uh, as a wa a big wa slash auric warclans player, sounds good to me. Thumbs up all round. Any thoughts on any of that, Phil? Uh, I'm I'm quite glad they did it because you quite often did both of those on me. I'm pretty sure. So yes. um, makes yeah a refreshing change. Uh, yeah. You've got to pick a lane and stick to it. So that is yeah. um, that's good. Absolutely. Tell us about the Sons of Behemoth, noting um, that Spike Kits have had no changes. Yes, correct. So this is Wrath of Titans, the earth-shaking roar. So you replace the first sentence with pick one enemy unit within three inches of this model and roll a dice. On a three plus, that unit cannot issue or receive orders, stratagems for 40k players, in the following combat phase. In addition, if the first roll was successful and that enemy unit has a wounds characteristic of one or two, roll 2d6. If that roll is higher than the unit's bravery characteristic, for each point by which the roll exceeds the unit's bravery characteristic, one model in that unit flees, which basically kills them. Uh, that unit's commanding player decides which models flee. The um, That's quite good because it stops you from breaking coherency deliberately. Um, the effect of this monstrous rampage is not considered to be a Battleshock test, um, which I guess means I could take a Battleshock test at a later date. Um, I can't remember what it was before, so I don't know if this is a buff or a debuff. Um, but it still sounds good. It sounds fine, doesn't it? Um, again, it's been a weird one, isn't it? Because the game of AOS has kind of had the same problems with balancing Sons of Behemoth that um, that Those 40k knights. has had with knights, right? Mm. Like they're just big stat check things, and yeah. But they, again, it's different in Sigma because everything hits and wounds on the same profile even though obviously you can have certain things that like debuff that. But yeah, the fact is, is that, yeah, there are, there are different problems to the, or rather different solutions around the similar problem. But yeah, I, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, changes to Sons of Behemoth is always interesting. I, I, I definitely think the game is better off with the Sons of Behemoth not being like crazy overpowered or crazy good. Um, but again, you do want to see them kind of be represented here and there, but um yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I mean, again, maybe it's to do with the sort of limited exposure I've had to the sort of full 2,000-point game system. I've majoritively played doubles um, in AOS so far, uh, but I've not really ever seen that much uh, Sons of Behemoth, uh, Behemoth, Behemoth, Behemoth uh, all that often. But anyway, there we go. Um, so that's all the changes that we know of. There was nothing else worth highlighting, was there? It's just points after that. Uh, yes, no, that is correct. Yeah, so, I mean, winners and losers. Uh, Cities of Sigmar has had some points decreases um, uh, for some things, mostly uh, non-human units, and then it has seen increases. So, like, steam tanks have gone up. Uh, the uh, Command Corp has gone up. Um, so, yeah, so there's some changes there. But across the board, it feels like, We've definitely seen more point decreases than we've mm. seen increases. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, pretty much every, every army's gone down. Uh, yeah, no exceptions. Yeah. Gloom, Sky, Gloom Spike gets half of them have gone 
down and half up. Yeah, Caldron Overlords, everything's gone up. And I, when we say everything, the ones that have gone up, not every single unit. Um, yeah, the Ironclads has gone down, though. Um, yeah, loads of other things have gone down. Sobalite Graveyards have had a couple of units go up. Same with Seraphon, same with Skaven. But pretty much everything else is stuff's gone down. And I don't know if that's just to make people feel better before the edition ends um, or not, but... Yeah, it's interesting. I think in terms of my... Uh, I, I think Nagash went down 40 points for most, so he's now under uh, 900 points, which I think is... I don't know. I don't have him, but most people seem to think that's a reasonable price. Uh, yeah, my army from the doubles went down 10 points because Reichlin and Orvagrim Hader got a 10-point reduction, uh, which literally doesn't help you in any way whatsoever because like, the smallest unit outside of a outside of an endless spell is like 90 points um and yeah things like enhancements not they called that but all free anyway so Mm. (laughs) yeah no no real change to my army uh so um yeah war clan side of things it seems pretty you got loads of point changes some of your stuff's gone down 20 30 points that's huge yeah, yeah. So the, the 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 big pigs have all gone down significant quantities. So um, between twenty and thirty point reductions for the big pigs, uh, which is really good. Um, it feels like they didn't sell enough of those. Uh, um, the uh, Zoggrot Anvil Smasher has gone down by ten points, which feels pretty nominal. Um, again. I don't really understand the value of Zogrot in the grand scheme of things. I get that people sort of like if the war chanter just feels infinitely better and it's like 30 points less. Um, but you know, clearly there's something to Anvil Smasher that I'm not fully appreciating yet. Um, he's probably okay. Um, but yeah, the Ard Boys reduction is meaningful. So Ard Boys going down to 200 points for 10, really, really meaningful change. So now, if you take two units of 10 Ard Boys and the Ard Boys Big Boss, uh, you've saved 50 points across that, um, which is not not meaningful. Um, similarly, uh, Godrak has come down by a uh, further 20 points. Um, so they'd already seen some points reduction. So now a regular Moor Crusher is 450. Uh, Godrak is 440. That seems appropriate because... The Maw Crusher has more flexibility with customizational options like uh, your mount traits, etc. Um, but yeah, like overall, I, I, I feel like yeah, the, um, the the War Clans definitely feel like they're in a good spot. Um, definitely interested to see what that brings to the table. Um, yeah, no, really, uh, really interesting series of uh, series of changes um, across the board. Mine a little uh, gripe, just to say, uh, on Slaves to Darkness and Sons of Beermot, uh, Games Workshop uh, graphic designers need to go back to, uh, you know, uh, Adobe PowerPoint, sla- not PowerPoint, Adobe Acrobat slash uh, Photoshop slash wherever these tables are generated because their formatting is wrong on Slaves to Darkness and Sons of Beermot. Uh, they need to right, get that. A, let's have a look. Yeah. It's a very minor formatting grumble, Phil. This is like Saves proper. Yeah, on I... page seven. Oh, sorry, not the points. Oh, it is on page seven. Yeah, yeah. the points. The Fedra Skull Sky Sryer. Yeah. See if the graphic designer of you could spot the uh, the formatting error. It's really finickety, this. No, I don't see anything wrong with it. The pink box is, uh, they've not, uh, they've not applied the white boundary to it. So it overlaps onto the red area. What, what do you mean? It's, I say it's like the most finickety thing to spot, but it is there. I don't know what you're on about. So, Let me share my screen with you, Phil. Let me share my screen. Here you go. You see it, Phil? Look at that. Look at that there. Not loaded up yet. Oh, God. Everyone at home is loving this. Look at this. Can you even see what I'm pointing at? 
I, I can, but I don't know what I meant to be seeing exactly. Oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. If it's if it's that it's, minor that I I don't think it's a problem. I think there isn't. There's no overlapping of anything. Well, I'm telling you, mate, it's a problem on my screen. I don't know whether it's just maybe my version of. Acrobat. And what was the it's, other uh, one other than uh... the War Stomper Mega Gargant has the same problem, which is also on page seven. The pink oh. box it overlaps onto the it, it's it's onto what degree the points? Yeah, that's just on your screen, mate. It, it's not on mine. Nah, mate, that's a, that's an issue with their design, Doc. It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's probably more with your eyes because it's not even on the screen share that you gave me. <laughs> oh, it was know. on the screen share. It, it was there. there. Okay, I don't. Phil, I don't see anything I'm, personally. It, maybe your PC needs updating. All right, I'm going to share this screen with you one more time. We're going to do it. All right, you're gonna you're gonna see it. Behold, look, look, Phil, look. It's minor, but it's there. And oh, no, I still don't see it, mate. Well, there you go. I'm starting to doubt you. Uh, you, you you're and, gonna have uh, to you're awesome. gonna have to screenshot it and circle the bit that you're talking about. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. it might right be. Do you now. know what it might be? It might be your monitor colors are adjusted slightly to highlight it. Whereas I'm not seeing it on my monitor, which would explain it. Oh, um, you're, saying, you're saying it's my uh, my. Well, no, my, I'm uh, I'm saying the problem might exist in the file, but your monitor's cal- calibrated in a way where the regular designer clearly didn't see it. So if you've got your brightness or contrast up a bit higher, um, it's it, what what you need to do is take a photo of your screen with your mobile yeah. and send me that image because then i'll see what you're seeing because i'm not seeing yeah. it when you share it i'm gonna share it with you on whatsapp now it's important i want to i want <laughs> i want the listeners at home to know that here. you're not mad there you go i've sent it to you on whatsapp open that whatsapp you look at it oh <laughs> right i got i've got to zoom in very far okay yeah, right. yeah. now let me because I'm looking oh, at on see. a mobile phone. Hold on, let me zoom in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So mega. It's there, Phil. It's there. I'm telling you. Hold on, I've zoomed. <laughs> this is why. I'm no, it doesn't phone. exist on my phone, so it must be. Oh your... no! <laughs> it is a problem but, with your. Uh, Acrobat, but it doesn't I exist guess. on any of the other charts. It doesn't exist on any of the other ones. That's that's weird. Yeah, it's weird though, isn't it? It was. No, and it, 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 there you go. This is, these are the sort of things that keep me up at night. Fire those anyway, designers. I know. Right, look, there we go. That's Age of Sigma out of the way. Thanks everyone <laughs> for listening. Phil, final thoughts, and then we're going to transition out of here. Uh, they they did my night haunt dirty, but that's just me personally having a gripe. Um, overall, yes, they've done a good job at fixing what are considered like the key problem uh, armies or builds. Um, so yeah, it's all right. It doesn't personally affect me. Uh, I wish it did. Uh, <laughs> that that's my summary, basically. There you go. Spotted another small gripe, Phil. Oh, you notice that the uh, Skaven box on page uh, seven. We we'll stay on page seven for a while. Okay, the Skaven. The Skaven box. The di- the dims of the Skaven box are different from the Seraphon box. It's it's you know it's a small little thing. No, I think you're making it up. There's something wrong with. I don't think I'm making it up. It's slightly more narrow. Oh yes, no, you're correct. Yeah, no, <laughs> there I, we see, go. I see that. You you get points from that one. Well Yay! Done. Well done, Dan. <laughs> Fire those designers. Exactly. Get those designers and, and, and ha- string them up. <laughs> exactly. They need to. They need to tickle their feet until they give us new Nighthawk rules and uh, <laughs> fix their formatting. Unbelievable. Anyway, there we go. That was Age of Sigma. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we certainly do. Here's a transitional noise. <laughs> hey all! It's that part of the podcast where because. Good old Snozberry was nice enough to leave us a five-star review with an Instagram handle attached to it. 
it is customary that we take a moment to shout them out, to pay attention to their Instagram, and to ultimately attempt to incentivize you to consider following them on Instagram. And to be honest with you, definitely feels like an account worth following uh, at a glance. Uh, pretty good standard of painting overall, I would say. Wouldn't you agree, Phil? Uh, very much so. Also, a relatively prolific painter and wide ranging based on the sort of number of armies that they've been working on. Mm. I think the thing is with Instagram, right, is like a lot of the time people need specific kind of like gimmicks, don't they? Because like the best performing uh, Instagram painters are the ones that kind of define a specific type of style. Like, I really like uh valborn for example not that he is specifically a painter but he does all the green stuff and all that loveliness and then mm. there's people like thunderwolfen who uh specializes in their kind of strange over the top sort of grim dark space marines with lots of fur all over them and chains and crazy stuff and you know an an, an, a, an abundant use of the uh forge world uh upgrade kit for uh, blood angels and that specific helmet etc etc and then there's that other guy who like smushes stuff together from loads of like sprues and paints them in this really kind of like weird uh almost like metallic style um this uh from snozberry paints is none of that uh in so much as what you're seeing here is just really nicely painted miniatures in what i would call a pretty games workshoppy kind of heavy metal sort of style with a really good level of attention to detail and some really nice embellishments on the bases. I think overall, pretty much everything I'm looking at here looks really, really great. Um, and I feel like Snozberry is kind of almost in the same kind of category as like, say, Sean, for example, which is an incredibly talented painter who deserves way more followers and way more attention than they're probably getting. Um, would be my executive summary of what I'm seeing here from the snods. Yeah, no, totally agree. They're like a sort of parade level and above, if I was uh, mm. to, to categorise it in, in some way. Definitely not tabletop standard, nicer than that uh, for sure. Um, and a really good yeah, mix of armies. So there's Tyranids, Necrons, uh, Chaos Knights, Space Marines, uh, Gene Steeler Colt, um, and even some Chaos Demons thrown in there, and, and a couple of other like random bits and pieces. Some very cool objective markers using the old, um, I think they were six or seventh ed uh, sort of dice holders for. I think it was predominantly for like the tank explosions and stuff like that, and. Um, mysterious objectives. There you go. Do you I was remember say, those? Yeah, the, 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 yeah, I do. Yeah, because it was a so it was a pack, wasn't it? It came in a las uh, pack. Yeah, las pack Thin. for the actual like. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was amazing, and it had these little skeleton servo skull plimps, and they came with a set of dice, and you had to roll the dice and see what you got, so you could get like a force field that gave you a. Was it a six-up invert or something really terrible like that? It was like um, a five-up or a six-up invert, maybe. Y- yeah, it was some form of invert save. I think it might have just been a six-up, but I can't. But basically, the one that everyone wanted was the Skyfire because there yes. was like you could roll like a dice a and then you could... Yeah. Actually, you know what? One of the things that really st- stunned me actually as I was going back through some um, sixth edition rules the other day because I, me and Richie were flirting with the idea of playing some games of sixth edition because richie's really Ooh. nostalgic for it i totally forgot in sixth edition I'll, I'll ask you if you remember in sixth edition what was unique about missile launches oh unique about missile launches um so obviously there are two modes of fire right for flag. well yeah so they have um, the frag grenade frag. and the crack grenade uh, sorry crack missile frag missile but there was something else Oh, is it because some of them, I don't think necessarily all of them, had an anti-air option as well? Yeah, they had the, I think, I can't remember now off the top of it, it like was like a sky sky hammer sequel? missile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah something, sky, like something like that. And it was like a 20-point upgrade. It was quite expensive, but it was like, oh, you've got, you know, a missile that you can shoot at aircraft. I was like, oh, wow. Totally, completely blanked that that used to be an option. 
Um, anyway, but yeah, that, that's really cool to see. I love, love the uh, Gene Steeler Colts limousine. Um, I'm stunned that Games Workshop still haven't gotten around to uh, reimagining the GSC limo. Uh, yeah, I sort of feel like the rock grinder is the equivalent of it because it's no. much more industrial. But you're right, it isn't an actual limousine. And I don't, as cool as a limo is, I sort of don't feel like it would fit in the aesthetic of Gene Steeler Colt, unless they did like sort of almost like Hive Noble Gene Steeler Colt rather than the sort of the bottom dwellers of the hive. Um, yeah, they'd have to do like Hive Nobility, which would probably work better for um, Necromunda. And then you could include that somehow, you know, an Ash Wastes limo for Gene Steeler Colt. Maybe that's what they need. Mate, I'll tell you, I'm totally there for it. I think that's the thing, right, with the GSC is they become very much that kind of mining colony aesthetic but mm. obviously the GSA and uh, C weave their way into all parts of imperial society uh, and there's no reason why they couldn't climb to the upper echelons I mean in many instances they do so the idea of them you know having their own limo uh, is is a win I especially love the fact that um, Snosbury has fitted their limo with uh, LED uh, lights on the underside so it's projecting uh, blue LEDs from the bottom. So it's a really, you know, it's a really pimp uh, yeah. vehicle. It's yeah. it's beautiful. I mean, it's a fair play to you, Snosbury. You've done an amazing job on that. Absolutely gorgeous. Oh, also, I, different. Yeah, I, I think I've actually seen his Gene Steeler Colt uh, limo before because I think it's Pete Build Stuff did a competition and I think it was entered and it was one of the finalists and I was one of the oh, judges. Oh, wow. So, yeah, because it, it looks familiar. I'm sure I've seen it before. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic mini. I assume it's some kind of 3D print, I would assume. Yeah, you'd guess so, or it's like a kit bash using some kind of toy car or something of that nature, but really cool to see. Um, mm. And again, I was going to say I really like his three different transcendent Catan builds. I think those are really cool. So he's got a green, an orange, and a and a blue. Uh, oh, which, yeah. Like, Oh, look, glorious. Um, oh, he's even got a fourth one. He's got a pink one as well, or a purple one, depending on which uh, palette. Uh, obviously, you can't use four Transcendent Catans, um, but that one looks like it's just on a regular flying base. So I'm guessing it's the one that goes inside the obelisk, uh, as uh, opposed to... Right, yeah, because all the others have nice, like, themed bases. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. There's a lot of good stuff, to be sure. Oh, look, there's some Man. even even some AOS stuff. I missed the AOS stuff. What's the AOS stuff? Um, it's uh, Carlia Von Karstein Warhammer Plus AOS Mini. So it might be the only one. It's all sandwiched. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In between uh, some of the Gene Seeker Cult stuff. So, yeah. I mean, technically, the demon units can be AOS as well, can't they? Uh, yeah, I mean, technically, it could. Yeah. There you go. But again, thank you, Snozberry, for your five-star review. Uh, you have myself and Phil now as followers and probably Lookout, sir. Uh, we'll probably get around to following on there as well. Um, so, yeah, massive thank you for supporting the podcast. Uh, thank you for the five-star review and keep up with the good work. I'm really looking forward to seeing the stuff that you're going to be doing in the future. What you're showing here looks absolutely excellent. Um, so, yeah, dead impressive. Well done, you, for being good at this uh, and keep it up. Any more from you, Phil? Uh, no, I think you've uh, summed it up very succinctly. Beautiful. All right, transitional noise. All right, Phil. I'm I'm good, thank you. How are you, Dan? Brilliant. I'm all right, mate. I'm all right. It's the outro, don't you know? By gum. Although. Uh, we're not going to go crazy long uh, for this outro this time around because uh, time restraints on the old hosting platform. We've uploaded too much already, Phil, this, uh, no. this last month. So we have to be behaved. Um, so is there anything you want to talk about? Oh, um, let's see. I have I think I've worked out what I might do for RFW 
I was actually toying Ooh, with hello. lists uh, for that. But what is um, RFW, Phil? I have never heard of it. Um, I mean, we've talked about it last on a podcast. It's a event tournament. Not really a tournament. It's a gaming event uh, run by our good friend over at Rapid Fireball Gaming uh, down in Kent. I've been to all three. This is the fourth one. You've been to two, I believe, if I recall correctly. Because you missed I mean, one, that, right? I went mean, to two out of the three, yeah. yeah. And I, I would have you've... gone to all three, but I had other obligations. Oh, you had a wedding or something silly to go I to, know, didn't terrible, you? Terrible, terrible. I know. Um, yeah, it's meant to be quite a casual um, event. Uh, we always recommend people go to it. Quite a few listeners uh, always show up, which is really nice. Um, and, yeah, it's just a bit of a, a, a laugh. It uses um, sort of mono-faction structures. So the idea is you just take uh, a detached... Well, you don't really get detached with that. You just take a faction, and that's really it, plus your agents of the um, Imperium and stuff like that, I assume, is still happening, basically. Uh, but you can't just take whatever you want. I mean, you can take whatever you want. You just can't... It's basically using regular 40k rules at the moment, which is basically because 40k doesn't have allies either. Yeah, I was just trying to think about that as I was talking about it. So I think, yeah, that is what it is now. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, I mean, 40k is it, now is a You could technically you take. You could you technically take a different factions, but you just lose your bonuses or they kind of. Because that's what it used no, to that's be. All, that's all gone now. That's all gone. It's now just pick a sub, pick a faction, isn't it? Yeah, pick a faction, pick a battalion thing, you know, like a thing, and then just work within that restriction, which is basically just everything has to have the same keyword, and that's it, yeah. really. Ah, so it's basically normal forty k then. Um, normal forty k. But what uh, are you going to take, Phil? What What are you doing? You've you, You've been hiding a Gene Steeler cult army that you're going to be bashing out in the no time at all i mean i i would like to but no um i've um the last three times i've gone with uh, my death Corps of krieg That's um true. i'm That's true. wanting to take my mind tools army but i'm sort of stuck at around 1500 points so i've never quite had enough or maybe slightly under never quite had enough to tip it over to the 1750 which is the points format for this event um, and I was toying around today, and I can basically build one model for my Space Marines, and then I've got enough points. Can, out of the stuff that you think I've built but not painted, what could that one model be? Uh, the Repulsor. Correct. It is. Uh, plus two Assassins. Uh, ah, okay. Which <laughs> got, got painted and that um if i don't take any enhancements that i think puts me exactly on uh 1750 um nice so i could get some playability I, I was thinking about doing something different slightly uh in that because normally i've got a jump pack captain and i give him like a moss crafted um uh what's it called it's um not is it relic blade it is relic blade isn't it yeah relic blade um, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i was thinking I can just go wild. It's like, what else has a jump pack? And I was like, oh, I could take him a strike. And it's like, I, I know he's got a pistol and uh, and like the lightning claws, but I'm like, kind kind of works. I mean, strike doesn't have a a, a shield, uh, but he does have an inbound save. Hub. Well, I know, but nothing is really anymore. That's, that's <laughs> a slight problem with that build. But it, it worked before because there was a upgrade to give your model um, t- basically the toughness and sort of save yeah, off yeah, Gravis. Yeah, yeah. Um, or wounds characteristic of Gravis. Um, although saying that, what, what was interesting is because I obviously built it when Inceptors were the only jump infantry. Um, mm. And I perhaps didn't quite appreciate that they were Gravis jump infantry versus what could be non Gravis. In, uh, jump infantry, which is obviously what mm. we now get with the with the Gravis uh, captain and the assault uh, intercessors and jump backs. Um, so yeah, that one's always a bit of a stray, uh, a bit of a strange um, uh, armor infantry that I'm always just going to have as a as a character with armor that is technically incorrect. But that was you know a cool look and the only 
armor in jump packs that I could get at the time when I made it. Um, so yes, uh, if I, I mean, take it looks uh, great, mate. I, I I wouldn't beat yourself up about it. It looks good. No, I don't. I don't think anyone would. But I love the idea. Of, like, if I wanted to, I could actually um, run them as a Raven Guard uh, detachment uh, rather than my normal white scars uh, and take him as Shrike because I sort of feel like the weapons are pretty similar. Um, and I, yeah, it was yeah. also more just a way of because uh, I think Shrike's 100 points versus 85 for a captain. So it was just a, a sneaky way of uh, making my army more expensive so I don't have to paint as much. Uh, here's, here's another one. You could take all your Stern Guard and uh, sorry, you could take all your intercessors and just say they're Stern Guard now. Hmm, interesting. Um, I mean, I guess they're not quite WYSIWYG in terms of the combat weapons. What, what, what? They don't have to have a combat weapon. They've got bolt guns. Oh. They, oh, I didn't think about that. Because the miniatures come with the combi bolters, don't they? they well, yeah, but they can. So, so they Stone can Guard just have regular just ones. Have, yeah, Stone Guard bolters or combi weapons. Mm. And the Stone Guard bolters are actually really good. So, yeah. Oh, they better than regular bolters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, they've got uh, devastating wounds on them. Oh, okay. Mm. Food for thought. Um, yeah, because I was going to... 90 gonna... points rather than 85 or whatever, or 80 that the intercessors are. So it's, a, you know, a, across three units, that's like 60 extra points you spent there. Oh, that's true. Okay, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, Captain and Jump Pack, Lieutenant with uh, Power Sword, uh, mm. three squads of 10 regular intercessors. Could be Stone Guard potentially. Uh, wait, wait. Um, I mean, and they're very embellished. Your intercessors. You've put a lot of details on them. Well, that is true. Yeah. Well, I've got one uh, with they're just sort of all bronze, and then two lots um, with the red shoulder pads. So potentially the just pure kind of more goldy bronze armored ones could be the Stone Guard if I want a way of sort of distinguishing them. Because obviously, I do mm. need some battle line units, and Stone Guard, I assume, aren't battle line. You don't need any battle line units. Don't, don't you need at least one? You like no. that's not a thing anymore. Oh god. Okay. I, I, I'm sort of. It's just so ingrained in my brain to have like I've got to have battle line. Um. I mean, I guess yeah, there's advantages in having battle line, but okay. There yeah, isn't. Forgetting that you don't. Okay. Um. Then I've got my two contemptors, which I'll run as actual relic contemptors because legends rules um are allowed. Uh, nice. And then I've got my free free man squad of inceptors. Um, yes, uh, Cladius, no, not Cladius, uh, Caladius, and the Eversaw at the right points. Yep, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the two at those points, I assume. Well, oh, actually, that's interesting. So normally, but I think it's between a thousand points you get one imperial agent, and two thousand points you get two imperial agents. So. Would I be getting two or one? I guess it would technically be uh, you, one. Maybe. You, you get two because it because you're still playing a strike force game, a two thousand point called. game. I guess technically you'd be doing that, but with slightly less points. Is how yeah, I yeah, would yeah. assume it. Would yeah, be that's done. how it is. Because yeah, because a two thousand point game is still a strike force game, and then obviously one thousand point is what an incursion. Yes, and then yeah, lower than that would be a combat patrol. And then over over that is what an onslaught, or onslaught whatever it's called, whatever yeah. the big end is. Onslaught, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so yeah, you'd sit within the, the 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 strike game thing. So that would yeah. So under those stipulations, two assassins would be fine. Mm. If not, I'll I'll be running some stone guard to <laughs> make up the points. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Honestly, I will, yeah. I, honestly, I just take three units to Yeah, so I, basically I've got two months, I think, before the event, roughly, and I was like, oh, one repulse. It's a vehicle quite easy to do, potentially, although there's a lot. It's just big, right? But I'll be airbrushing most of it, some edge highlights, yeah, some weathering, some transfers. Should be doable uh, in like a you know a week or so. Or two the weeks. other thing that you could consider is you could consider taking Asriel as a captain instead uh, for the Stone Guard squad, because as we were talking about earlier, he's quite good in Stone Guard. Mm, uh, yeah, I mean, I've got a captain mini that I've built, but um, the, originally I was going to run as Cross Khan um, for the White Scars, because I, mm. you know, I, I sort of whizzy-wigged him as that, so he's got like a little owl flying 
to represent uh, Khan's eagle that even, I think now it doesn't even have an, any ability, but it used to um, have like a little mortal wound attack. Um, and he was also really cool because I think he, him and his squad used to do, I think it was like plus one to wound, which was very strong, but doesn't have that anymore. So yeah, but maybe he could be ran as another, yeah, character on foot for sure. Yeah, um, why but, not but he, really? Yeah, but I feel like if I have him, oh, interesting. I was just thinking if I have just him on his own, and I paint him up and run some of the intercessors as stern guard. Is that enough points? Well, no, because your um, your still have a, there is a hundred and ninety something points, mate. So you'd have a hell of a. Well, exactly. Them. Yeah. Well, no, I was thinking. Well, surely. Well, how much? What's the points of between regular intercessors and stern guard? Like ten points. Uh, what for the squad or for per model? Oh, uh, so for the squad, it's twenty points. Uh, is that, so for it's it's ten points for the five man. 20 point difference for the for the set. So the, oh, a, a, a 10 man unit of Stone Guard is 180 points. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, even if I ran them all with Stone Guard, that's only a 60 <laughs> plus 60 points. That's not <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I'll be building the Repulsor if I'm doing anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, it could it could get you around the double assassin problem. You know, you could just have one. Oh, if that is a problem. It. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, I mean, I can always run an Inquisitor. Oh, actually, no, because I can only have one. Yeah, same problem. Oh, actually, no, what I would do is because the way I pointed it, it was exactly on the nose and I hadn't taken any enhancements. Mm, So mm. I could potentially take some enhancements. Um, I guess, mm, yeah, the downside of that is I would probably need to take the generic uh, captain with jump pack so I could then give him an enhancement. So even though he's 20 points cheaper... Oh yeah, maybe it's not worth it because Shrike is twenty points more. No, fifteen points more because it's eighty-five points for a regular guy. Mm. But I think the enhancements can go up to like twenty-five, thirty points. Well, what I'm hearing is, is you didn't actually. You were suggesting you didn't have a captain, and so it didn't sound like you had a captain before, right? You had a lieutenant, but you didn't have. You had uh, a jump yeah, on foot. Yeah, I've got a jump captain only. Um, which oh, and in which case, in which case, yeah, make them all stern guard. Uh, make that uh, one uh, add a captain, and then yeah, because even if you just add a regular captain, that's still like I think eighty five points. So you're then even looking. So what is that point? You're looking at like a hundred and thirty five points. No, hundred uh, f- hundred forty five points, isn't it? So. You know, you're not far off the 190 no. for the repulsor at that point. And, and then, then all you've got yeah, to do is paint a two. captain. <laughs> True. Although the, the downside with the captain is he's got a back banner on, which is always going to be a bit time consuming. And I, I sort of... Well, just, hmm. just just go out and get a new captain mini and just but do something crazy, Phil. I know this sounds bad. Buy a captain mini, like a standard old captain. Just uh, build him the way no. that you're supposed to. No. And just paint him. Um, although I think I've got one, but it's the Gravis one. I've got plus the, I mean, I've not got them built. No, I think I'll, I don't know. I quite like the idea of doing the Repulsor because it's been sat on my. It's really good, man. The Repulsor is fun because you've got that ability where you can, um, if you're declared as a charge, you can get, oh, you can get back in. Oh, that's true. Which is, which is a really cool thing. It it complements Stern Guard really well. Plus it, I think they look, it looks nice as well. So yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think that'd spent, be fun to build. You spent like a summer magnetizing it. You should get it done. Yes, true. Well, I think, um, yeah, I've got one built, and I think I've got one sort of. Even, I think I I started to partially build the second one because I got two from the was it Conquest or Imperium magazines, whichever the first oh, one yeah, was. Yeah, whatever right the first one was. Yeah. Um, so I've got two, but only one like properly built. So I think I'll just get that one out of the way rather than trying to do both. I mean, ideally, I should be building and painting Thunder Warriors all year until September uh, for the event I've got then. But I sort of yeah, feel but like you can't I'm just be doing that spare. all the time. Yeah, well, I almost need to, but I feel like I potentially uh, got enough to spare, like a, a few weeks to a month, painting up something nice for RFW. So I might try and do that because. I, I don't really want to take my guard yet again to that event. It'd be nice to dust off. Well, not I say dust off. Uh, bring out the shiny army that's new. And I say new, it's like three, four years old now at this point. But I just 
don't get a chance to play it that much at tournaments. No, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, you could just paint the unit hell blasters. You've got like five hell blasters in your collection. That'd be fine. They're like 130 points, I think, or something like that. 120. Yeah, that's true. No, I do have. It depends uh, what's easier for you. The repulsor will be a big project. Like that's going to take. That's going to really take some time. Whereas painting five infantry, oh, I don't. I don't know. I. I sort of feel like the I mean, the repulsor's got lots of fiddly weapons, but I feel like yeah, yeah. overall it's a lot simpler to paint up because it's 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 fiddly because I'll be airbrushing lots of um, gradients on it, mm, um, mm. sort of in a contrasting um, sort of modular uh, way. Mm. But yeah, I sort of feel like overall it won't be too bad. Um, um, well, I mean, you know, I think you've got a lot of experience in painting vehicles, so you probably smash through that quicker than the infantry, to be fair. So, yeah, mate, go for it. I say, I say, or, I mean, what you could do, wild idea, throw it out there. I'm just going to actually check that this is possible. But you could purchase a Repulsor Executioner build the turret and just put the executioner turret on it yes uh, there's a few minor differences um because it doesn't have the um the like a defensive array weapons on the sides um but you can technically just take the turret off and stick it on and it pretty much works good enough i would say um yeah i mean looking at it they're basically the same kit except for the turret so yeah that's oh true. yeah, no, you're right. They're they're missing. Well, that's interesting. They are actually missing the defensive arrays, aren't they, on the sides? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, interesting. I never really clocked that ah, before. Because I've magnetized them, I could just take the weapon bits off. <laughs> so it's just the the little um, spinny turret bit is still oh, there. Super weird. How does he do that then? Because literally, I'm looking at the kit and it's got the slots for the defensive array bits of it on the actual plastic. I assume there's something that fills it in. I don't Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the difference is with this one is so the difference is with this one you've got a different top plate. So you know how uh, on like the repulsor execution of uh, the regular repulsor the um the plate kind of fits in and then kind of covers over the gun. Yeah. In this one it's like got an extra bit that goes over the top that then Covers up those weapon emplacements, or as well. It's interesting. Never built a repulsor executioner. I built a repulsor, just haven't built the executioner. So interesting. Yeah, maybe that's not an option. Um, and also, I don't think the points differential is that great that it's worth the effort. True. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I love it, mate. Go forth, rock the marines. That's what I'm doing as well. I'm doing first company. I'm gonna have. Uh, I've got. I've got the stuff that I've built so far of it here in the tub. Here Ooh. in the tub, uh, so I've got a 10-man unit of Terminators with a captain. I've got a 10-man unit of Stern Guard with a captain. Uh, I've got a six-man unit of Blade Guard uh, with Marnie as Uh And I've got a 10-man unit of Vanguard with a captain. And then I've got Roberto Gilliman. Done. All the captains. All the captains and Roberto Gilliman uh, are having a party. Super captain. My captain, my captain. Uh, that's the, nice. uh, it's, that's the uh, way of it. Yeah. The, the age-old question, can you paint up an entire army in the same time that it takes me to paint one single model? Which was funny because we had the same uh, question, uh, uh, I think, for a previous RFW um, because I was doing my two contemptors. It was also, in fact, actually, I have taken uh, my mind tours one time. Um, but I guess the points difference was such that I, yeah, could, could take that whole army. Yeah, yeah. I think the difference now is that, yeah, 10th edition, the points have uh, decreased so dramatically. Um, but yeah, with this color scheme, it's pretty easy. Um, so yeah, I'll just, um, yeah, I should be able to smash it out fairly painlessly. Um, it'd just be, yeah, lots of, um, lots of, uh, enamel washes and uh and some basic detailing it's uh nice. yeah 
chuck the uh, streaking grime at it and call it a day. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. The liquid talent, as uh, Tom loves to call it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so RFW, I am looking forward to it. It's going to be fun to to get this project done for it. Uh, then I need to focus on Skellingtons for Old World. Actually kind of played Old World the other day for the first time. Uh, loved it. Thought it was a great game. Highly rate it. I think it's just, again, it's got its problems. Every, you know, kind of fledgling system does. But um, overall, I think it's just super fun. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to playing more of that. And then, yeah, uh, we did... Um, did Beachhead uh, weekend before last. Uh, wanted to say thank you to everyone who uh, came up and uh, said hello to me. Uh, Beachhead, uh, you know who you are. Uh, you shall go nameless. But, um, yeah, genuinely really thrilled that uh, people came up, found me, and uh, came along and said nice things. Uh, really means a lot. I know um, one of uh, one of the guys was quite brilliant because he um, – he was listening to me, uh, or rather, he was me and Joe were playing, and I was being very loud. Phil, could you imagine me loud? What masses. a surprise! Yeah. I know, I know. But yeah, me and Joe had to play against each other in game one because uh, Joe's opponent didn't turn up. And as the ringer, I was like, "I'll play Joe." I haven't played Joe in months, uh, and we were having a lovely time. And this guy comes up and he's like, "I can hear you from across the hall. Are you? Are you Dan?" And I was like, yeah. And he's like, ah, oh, I can't believe you're here. I love it. And he was like super in, uh, just really nice guy. Uh, asked me about like, ah, oh, yeah, because you say on the podcast that people come up and say hello to you. And yeah. And I and I was saying to him like, yeah, sincerely, like up till now, uh, or, uh, as I say, like never and still not yet ever has, uh, have I encountered anyone that I don't get on with uh, when they've come up and, and chatted to me at events and stuff. It's been lovely. I feel like, I know everyone always says this stuff and obviously, you know, the people who listen to you put out this kind of content are inevitably going to be of a like-minded nature to yourself. But yeah, sincerely, everyone I've ever kind of been lucky enough to encounter has been super lovely and that continued this weekend. So to everyone who came up and said hello to me at Beachhead, thank you. Uh, you, you were all great. I had a really lovely time catching up with you and um, yeah, you know, appreciate the support. It means a lot. Um, yeah. It's been a while, and it feels since anyone's really kind of approached you in any of those instances. But it's nice um, when it happens, isn't it? Yeah, I think last time, I think probably yeah, Warhammer Fest. Going back to then, I, I, I feel like when we go to the AOS ones, we're always a bit undercover. People don't. It's true. Are. It's true. I was going to say, do you mean like? It, it seems likely that Warhammer Fest is uh, well. Whatever's happening, Warhammer Fest is definitely not happening in May, is it? Like or April, or whenever it was last year. We're basically looking at a uh, if Warhammer Fest is happening, it's going to be end of the year situation, right? Yeah, I don't know. It's a it's an interesting one because yeah, this time last year they had already advertised it. I think we'd already bought all our tickets uh, for it. So I, I mean, it'd be interesting if basically due to all the negative. Uh, reactions to it they sort of threw the toys out of the pram and were like it's not worth us doing it for this kind of feels bad um on their behalf and i hope that's not the case i hope they're just taking a bit for more these time are to grateful do, people i know with demands for not having to queue to do stuff um yeah i just hope they're they're taking their time to do a decent job um it, yeah i don't know if they will or not interestingly there's a warhammer world anniversary coming up and as part yeah, of that yeah. they've said they're actually going to do some previews which i can't really remember if they did that last year and if if they did it was just like a model um whereas it feels like this time it's going to be like an actual like normal set of reveals so maybe this is their it's not quite warhammer fest but here's something uh for you instead yeah possibly i think the thing is is that I don't think it would have been because of negativity. I don't think Games Workshop pay that much attention to what like pillocks like you and I on the internet say, but um, I think it will just probably just be a logistics thing. Uh, I think the reason why Warmer Fest sort of made sense in April last year was because of where the Easter holiday sort of sat. Um, it was a, a, a bank holiday weekend, et cetera, et cetera. So it all kind of made sense. Um, and also, obviously, they were supporting the launch of 10th edition Warhammer 40,000. Warhammer 40,000 is their flagship game, makes a lot of money. 
So not a great shocker that they kind of, uh, you know, pulled out all the stops for that one. So, yeah, I, 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 even and again, even though Warhammer Fest itself was pretty underwhelming, I had a really good time playing in the tournament and I had an amazing weekend spending time with friends and connecting with people that I know all across the hobby. And that's the thing that I loved about Warhammer Fest and the reason why I'm sad to see it not happening again. I had an amazing weekend in Manchester, had a great time just surrounded by, again, the example I gave at the time, it reminded me of what it was like when I was back at university where you're in a city and you know lots of people. It's just a really nice sort of buzzy, energetic vibe where you're part of like a community of people out and about having fun and being part of something. That was really lovely. But yeah, Warhammer Fest itself was pretty underwhelming, but everything going on around it was incredibly fun. So, um, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully we get to see it again, but, uh, well, well I hope so. Cause if they, if they don't have it, that sort of means there's not really going to be a golden demon in the UK unless they tack it onto another event, probably at Warhammer world, but then it feels like it's not getting the prestige that it sort of deserves. Um, I don't know, you say that when they did Golden Demon at Warhammer World uh, in 2022, it got a lot of love, didn't it? People really liked it there. So, you know, yeah, I don't maybe. think it's necessarily a bad thing. But yeah, hopefully, I don't know. As I say, it was just a really nice moment in time, I think. Um, but yeah, it was a fun weekend. But, you know, at the end of the day, we just recently got back from an amazing weekend at Warhammer World at the uh, Age of Sigmar Doubles. So, you know, you don't need uh, Warhammer Fest to have fun within the hobby. Um, it's just like, as I say, it's that collective thing where there's lots of people around. Um, yeah, it's a good vibe, I'd say, overall. But um, hmm. it is what it is. Uh, and that's all the time we've got, folks. Thank you very much for listening. This has been episode 174. You've been great. Phil, closing thoughts, feelings? Uh, you've been great, Dan. That's my f- closing thoughts. Always. <laughs> So humble. Anyway, goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.